one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, June 25th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 20 degrees. It's 18 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. A, co- a corruption probe netted charges against two Ottawa police officers. The investigation also leading to charges against two family members and a large seizure of drugs as well. Our Jason White following this story. The RCMP arrested and charged four people, including two Ottawa police officers, 45-year-old Mohamed Mohamed and 29-year-old Haider Al-Badri. Both are charged with obstructing justice, while Al-Badri is also charged with breach of trust and causing a person to deal with a forged document. Al-Badri's wife and younger brother are also charged, according to the CBC. 29-year-old Ashley El Badri was charged in the corruption probe along with 29 year old Mohamed Salama, while 23 year old Amir El Badri was arrested in a drug raid in the Glebe. Officers searched a home on Holmwood Avenue yesterday afternoon, hauling away nearly a kilogram and a half of fentanyl. In a statement, Ottawa's police chief writes these charges are very serious but do not reflect the overall integrity of his officers. But he says he knows this will shake the public's trust in the police service. Both of the arrested officers are suspended with pay. The investigation continues. Jason White, City News. City News Time, 9.01, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. We may have some more showers as we work through the day. South wind, the high 28 degrees. It'll feel a bit warmer with the humidity. Some showers this evening. We get into that steady rain overnight, 19 for the low. And tomorrow, windy with rain, 25 feeling like 31. More showers and thunderstorms possible for Sunday. For today, the high, 28. And right now in Ottawa, 20 degrees. It's 18 in Smith Falls. Ontario moves into the next phase of its reopening plan in less than a week's time. Not all businesses say they're going to reopen, though, when first allowed, coming up on Wednesday. Some feel their preparations have been made for the original date announced by the province, so that's when they do plan to allow customers back into their salon or their shop. Ontario enters step two on June 30th, next Wednesday. That is a few days ahead of schedule. The mayor of Miami-Dade County in Florida says three more bodies have now been pulled from the rubble of that 12-story building that collapsed near Miami. Death toll now four. Officials fear the number could skyrocket. The mayor, Daniela Levine Cava, says fire crews work through the night in hopes of finding survivors. I'm very hopeful because we have the best team in the world. They're working around the clock and um, they're using every possible tool, uh, the, the sonar, the dogs, uh, their world experience. And I know that they are hopeful and so we are hopeful as well. 159 people are still unaccounted for. Great news if you're a fan of the Montreal Canadiens. They advance to the Stanley Cup final. We insert historical significance here. It's the first time for that team since 93. First time in a decade any Canadian team has gotten this close to Lord Stanley's Cup. How did Montrealers celebrate it? They rioted. Some of them climbing on buildings and lampposts. A police car was flipped on its side. And that's when Montreal officers in riot gear moved in. <laughs> Tear gas was used to disperse the crowd starting just after 11 p.m. Police say several arrests were made, specifically for assault and mischief, that officers were also assaulted. The Bell Centre wasn't near maximum capacity due to public health restrictions due to COVID. The fans who were inside the arena were forced to stay there due to safety concerns. I'm Jamie Pulfer. And I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Inform your opinions. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Friday. We made it. Tough week for a lot of people. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. We have a very full program this morning. Some light fare, some heavy-duty stuff. We'll look back at a week's worth of headlines. Bork will be back. Pierre Bork from Bork News Watch. 
We'll do our Queen's Park Week in Review. There's a lot to get into with our panel of MPPs this week. And we'll be talking sports for sure after the big Habs win last night. Habs win in Montreal on Fête Nationale. Fireworks and tear gas. And the Habs are off to their first Stanley Cup final since 1993. I was 22 years old. I remember it well. Habs and Kings, Wayne Gretzky, Patrick Waugh. Liam McGuire is coming on our show this morning. Just a perfect guest for us. I mean, he's... You know him. He's a great hockey historian and a tremendous fan of the Montreal Canadiens. So he's going to be on our program at 945. And then a quarter after 11, hey, more sports, why not, with our good friend Steve Warren from the Sens Nation podcast and the Steve Warren Project. As well this morning, Andrew Scheer, the former leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, but more so, and for our purposes this morning, a former speaker of the House of Commons, and he's going to join us right after the 11 o'clock news. As I mentioned yesterday, the Trudeau Liberals are taking the Speaker of the House of Commons to court. To call this unusual wouldn't do it justice, it is unprecedented. And the Speaker is vowing to fight this Tooth and nail, and I say bravo once more to the Speaker, Mr. Rhoda. He is a liberal. He is a liberal member of Parliament, which makes it all the more extraordinary. This all has to do with the incredible story about the government lab in Winnipeg. The mystery, the intrigue. Scientists having their security clearances revoked after the RCMP and CSIS do some poking around, and eventually those scientists were fired. And we know viruses were sent to the Wuhan Institute in China. So wouldn't you like to know more about that? Don't you deserve to know more about that? What is that all about? What was going on in that lab? The the liberals say we're not allowed to know. National security. But MPs want to know. And members of parliament had a vote. And that vote passed through the House of Commons. MPs want to see the documents. They've outlined a way to look at the documents, they think, so national security would not be compromised. By having the vote and having a vote that passes, that means Parliament has expressed its will. And Parliament is supreme. But the Liberals refuse to turn over the documents. So the Speaker said, well, you're in contempt. You're in contempt of Parliament. You're ignoring the will of Parliament. You're in contempt of Parliament. You must produce the documents. And they continue to ignore that. MP said to Ian Stewart from the Public Elf Agency, show us the documents or we will call you to the bar. And he refused to produce the documents, so they called him to the bar. That's a flogging, a a verbal flogging, admonished by the Speaker of the House, something that hasn't happened in Canada in more than 100 years. What's in those documents? Why would, why would the Liberals go to these extraordinary lengths to keep those documents hidden? What are they hiding? What, what are they covering up? What are they up to? The Globe and Mail editorial today, my goodness, I mean, this was the newspaper of the Liberal Laurentian elite, the Globe and Mail. Its editorial today says what's going on in this country under this government, this Liberal government, it is Trump-like. This is the sort of stunt Donald Trump would try to pull off. And the Globe says, someone should point out to Mr. Trudeau that he's not a president. He's a prime minister. Big difference, but the prime minister fancies to be el presidente. 
even the Prime Minister has to obey the will of Parliament. In our system of government, it doesn't work the other way around. Mr. Trudeau appears to be the last to know. Some of the things that your government is up to in Ottawa is very worrying. Bill C-10 is a travesty. Rammed through the house in the dead of night. Now the Liberals are going even further with their curtailments on freedom of expression with a new bill on regulating hate speech on the Internet. Under this bill, you could be convicted of hate speech, of hate speech, sentenced to house arrest, ordered to wear a monitoring device, fined $70,000, and the prosecution doesn't even have to produce a victim of your crime. Just want to, anybody got a map? Is there a map around here? This is Ottawa, right? I just want to make sure I didn't wake up this morning in Beijing. No, Still looks like Ottawa. It's not, not Moscow. No, still Ottawa. Pyongyang. No, still Ottawa. Still living in Ottawa. Hard to tell sometimes. And then, you got to read this story here. David Pugliese's story in The Citizen. Military broke rules to collect data. Leaders acted without authority in surveilling citizens. <laughs> Must read. Must read. Front page, Ottawa Citizen. The Canadian Armed Forces spied on Canadians. What kinds of Cana Canadians, for example, who attended Black Lives Matter protests? I know people who attended Black Lives Matter protests. David knows people who attended Black Lives Matter protests. Military was spying on them. Spying on their own people. Spied on them. Mind their social media accounts and then ran propaganda ops against Canadians to try and influence Canadians' behavior during the pandemic to make sure there wasn't any civil disobedience. How's that for a bombshell report? Just another winner, winner, chicken dinner for the Minister of National Defense. He doesn't even know about it. They just went ahead and did it. Yep, the Minister of National Defense, he's on top of things, isn't he? Is this the just society that Pierre Trudeau had in mind for Canada? Is this the just society? A government that sues the Speaker of the House, a government that legislates draconian restrictions on free speech, a government that spies on its own people, a government that weaponizes public affairs. It appears so, and it appears Canadians can't get enough of it. Trudeau's up by 10 points in the polls. And then there's Jody Wilson-Raybould who, thank goodness, has no fear and is not afraid to speak truth to power. She tweets that Mr. Trudeau should spend less time obsessing over trying to win an election uh, and do something about, you know, like this headline, 751 unmarked graves. Spend less time trying to secure your majority government. Do something about that. Less time on being power mad, more time on truth and reconciliation. My words. And for that, Carolyn Bennett, Indigenous minister, steps right into it, shows her true colors, and accuses Jody Wilson-Raybould of only being interested in a pension. Because you only have to serve six years to qualify for an MP pension. You should resign. You should resign. 
Minister Bennett. In actual reality, Wilson Raybould's pension, if she collects one at all, it, will, it won't even be as generous as Carolyn Bennett's because Miss, Miss Bennett is loyal to Trudeau. So she will collect the pension of a cabinet minister for because of her loyalty. JWR is, uh, she's a backbench independent MP. Big salary difference there. What's the salary? About 60 grand a year difference, right? Also a big difference in the character of the two, I would say. So look, you can comment on any or all of this or something else entirely during the talkback hour, 10 to 11 this morning. It's the Friday free for all. We're open to discussing just about any topic. I mean, within reason, we usually stick to stuff that's been in the news this week. It's not carved in stone. It could be something you think should be in the news. Rob, I think this should be in the news. Maybe you have a minor pet peeve. Maybe you want to blow the whistle on a massive scandal. Whatever it is, feel free to share it here. At 750-1310, that's our call-in line right after the 10 o'clock news. 750-1310-613-750-1310. On the Rob Snow Show. On City News. It's a space that needs to be lived in. It's a space that people, you know, have to have an experience of more than just art on the walls, I think. You know, yes, the art on the walls is fun, and it's fun to walk around and see all the beautiful things, and, and, and the way Dominic and Edith have curated the gallery is certainly uh, something worth seeing. But, uh, yeah, coming by and asking questions, again, to Dominic's point of view is, you know, interrupt him, ask questions. Uh, you know, I'm here on most of the days, too. We have Luz that comes in, Nancy that comes in. So, yeah, we have quite a few opportunities for people to come in and, you know, uh, see the process and, of course, ask a few questions. It's a great space. Uh, basically, the one event that we do do, or we did do, <laughs> is, the, um, is the jazz shows, the jazz and blues shows. And I think the weird thing to let you know is that the acoustics in here are really amazing. Uh, I think that was the first thing that blew me away when, when we started doing shows or when I was part, uh, helping out with the shows. Um, and uh, the other part of the business, too, is we do rent it out for special occasions, too. So few weddings, uh, birthday parties, uh, product launches, that kind of thing. So they're also a lot of fun. We do have one artist that's, that's from the States, but uh, yeah, not, of the 30 odd artists, uh, the rest are from either Quebec, Ontario, and one uh, beautiful woman from BC. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely part of the philosophy to, to maintain and uh, canvas and show uh, the beauty that we have in our backyard. You have the very, very strong personalities in, in Edith and Dominic, of course. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see how that actually balances out in the rest of the gallery. Um, without necessarily being, you know, um, an objective, uh, we basically have half female artists and half male artists in this gallery. Uh, but it, I can't say it's anything more than choosing the best people, you know, and that's just the way it is. And I love that. I think it, it's great. You know, we've, you go through here and you're like, wow, it's all pretty cool. And yep, you know, it's half for women and half for men. It's cool. Like everyone else, we didn't know what to think, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's overwhelming at first. You just know that things are closed. Um, and now you're trying to figure out what you do during that, that downtime, which I think everyone did. And I think it's a, in March, the, the, the first close, the, the first shutdown, uh, it was a lot of actually recuperating and resting and, 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 and not worrying too much on the spot. Um, you know, it's, it, running a gallery is a bit like running a marathon with sprints. Um, so there comes a time where, yeah, it's actually nice to just take a break. Uh, and then you wake up and realize that, okay, now it's time to, uh, to wake up and deal with this new reality. From my perspective anyways, I, I, I think a gallery can be overwhelming and I like to make it fun. So you're gonna come in, I'll ask you questions. I might even joke around with you. You know, the most people come here, they're not really gonna buy art, but they could have a fun time and talk about it, right? Uh, and one of the things the gallery does offer is for, you know, for local um, purchases, we'll be happy to drive it to your house and hang it for you. Show returns on Rogers TV and City News 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Lowell is away this week. 
It was an explosive city council meeting on Wednesday. Haven't seen a council meeting like that in a long time, if ever. Jan Harder, the longtime councillor from Barhaven, she was on the hot seat and in the spotlight. All because of the findings of a report from this city's integrity commissioner about conflict of interest. And that report said Jan Harder tainted the planning process because of her relationship with a local development consultant, the Sterling Group. The report said she should be removed. As the planning chair, she'd be docked 15 days pay and be forced to repay legal fees. So when it came time for Harder to speak to the matter this week during the council meeting, she resigned from the planning committee and called the whole affair a politically motivated attack. This is to inform council colleagues of my decision to tender my resignation as chair and member of the City of Ottawa's planning committee effective immediately. Quite simply, the hyper-aggressive online attacks and libel directed at me and others since Friday threatens to curtail the city building work that must continue at the planning committee. I will not allow the endless noise and innuendo amplified online to railroad the important work the committee must accomplish to continue making Ottawa one of the most desirable cities to live in on the planet. The report infers an appearance of conflict of interest by me in my role as chair of the planning committee. However, here are the facts. There was no violation in hiring practices, no violation of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and no evidence of any conflict of interest. Over the last few days, I have faced online harassment from what appears to be an organized campaign from an agenda-driven lobby group. Aside from me, many individuals, including some around the council table, have had their good names tarnished. This vocal group of opponents seem to be against the transformational development we have been witnessing in this city. I maintain that the only finding this politically driven report has shown is that city policies on hiring need to be revisited and updated. I understand, however, that the report being tabled today has caused divisions within council. To my colleagues, I recognize this has put you all in a difficult position. That was never my wish, and for that, I am sorry. This decision hurts me as I have worked tirelessly and with great commitment over the last six years, actually more than six years, as the chair of planning and previously in other capacities in building our Ottawa as a world-class city where our citizens benefit from this growth. I am proud of my contributions to the development of our city. Rest assured that I will continue to work harder than ever for my constituents in Barhaven. I am looking forward to having increased availability to spend more quality time in the ward with my constituents. I will continue to work with like-minded councillors who seek to unify and not divide our great city. We are blessed to live in this city. Never forget that. I have always and will always work to make it the best it can be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Jan Harder, when sanctions against the councillor came up for debate, that's when things really became tense because the mayor tried to take it easy. Tried to take it easy on Jan Harder because Jan Harder and the mayor usually see eye to eye. Opponents of the mayor's would say she is a member of the Watson Club, the councillors who are loyal to Jim Watson and usually vote the mayor's way. We've talked about this idea of a, of a Watson Club. And we've also talked in the past about what it's like to be a councillor when you're not a member of the Watson Club. And that topic came up yesterday when we were joined by councillors Carol Ann Meehan and Catherine McKenney. So, you know, so councillor Meehan, do you think she should have been docked pay and had to should have been forced to repay those legal fees? Because that's, you know, that's well, let's what put it, it this way. If it had been me, if it had been I you, would be, I would, my pay would be docked and I would be, I would be repaying the legal fees. I have no doubt about that. And if it had been me who leaked the, the you know the, the minutes of that of the meeting of the law- lawsuit for they LRT, the they were I, seriously. I had they would have called the cops on you. Yeah, no, the book would the book would have been thrown at us, Rob. Mm-hmm. We have no doubt about that. So that we were speaking truth to power yesterday, and you know I think it took a lot of guts for Councillor Deans and for Councillor McKenney to say what they did yesterday. 
because that is that's been the feeling uh, through the entire uh, three years of council so far. I went in there as an independent. Uh, I have found out though that I I can't if I vote against the uh, uh, something that the that the mayor wants. All of a sudden, I'm sidelined. I, I, what do you I'm, mean by that? You're sidelined. You you have to be down there to understand. You have dissension, to be down there to dissension, understand. Dissension, dissension oh, sure, is not sure thing. Sure dissension, thing. Dissension is not welcome. It's you're either in the boat or you're, you're out of the boat in the in in hot water. So and seriously, I I feel that I vote with the mayor often. But if I have a legitimate, uh, you know, concern about something and I and I vote, I dissent. I feel like I've I've been ostracized, and I think that's wrong. And it, the, I feel what's happened yesterday now is going to drive an even deeper wedge between between the councillors. And going forward for the next year is going to be. I actually, I I would hope maybe it would actually heal this wound a little bit because we saw some councillors actually go against the mayor yesterday who would normally be on his side, especially when it came to the procedural uh, uh, amendment to you know that he was challenged on. Uh, maybe we'll see a little bit more give and take on this council, but my fear is that it's, we're going to be more divided going forward. Okay, I want to get uh, a little bit more into this. It was not my plan to do this, that if you vote against the mayor, uh, there are repercussions and you could be ostracized. And if there is a concern in your community, maybe it's um, it's not given adequate resources or addressed in an adequate way. Has that been your experience, Councillor McKenney? You know, it... <laughs> It, it, it's nuanced. There's no doubt. Um, it, it, it's never it, it's never uh, blatant. There's no doubt. But absolutely, you are sidelined. Yeah. You're punished. You're yeah. not invited to events, opening uh, events in your given, own ward. Yeah, exactly. You're not given credit where it's due. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the work that you try to do can be undermined. Um, yeah, there's there's no doubt. And again, you know, again, it's the mayor's job to, you know, to forward his agenda. To, to get the votes that he needs to move things forward. Uh, but quite frankly, you as a taxpayer and every, ta- and every taxpayer in the city pays for us, pays for their local government. And you deserve an independent, thoughtful government. And dissension really should be tolerated. I go back to the point that if every vote is twenty well they, you know twenty three to one or twenty four zero you do not need us all there. Council Meehan and I have disagreed several times on outcomes of, mm-hmm. of votes, yeah. Yeah, but we continue to work together it is It is okay not to agree, but it is not okay to then you know be be punished for that and Two city councillors from my show yesterday, Carol Ann Meehan, Catherine McKenney, not members of the Watson Club. We asked the mayor for an interview this week. His office declined. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. This hour of the Rob Snow Show is brought to you by Cardinal Planning.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, June 25th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 20 degrees in Smith Falls, 19. And here's what's making news this hour. Ottawa Police Chief not mincing words after two of his constables from the Ottawa force were charged in a corruption investigation by RCMP. Chief Peter Slowly says there can be no tolerance of criminal behavior or corrupt practices by members of the Ottawa Police Service. The two were charged with corruption in an RCMP investigation into a drug raid which netted a huge quantity of fentanyl. Miami-Dade County Mayor says three more bodies have been pulled from the rubble of that partially collapsed condo building in Surfside, Florida. 159 people are still unaccounted for after two of four buildings in a complex collapsed yesterday morning. Montreal police had to use tear gas to uh, disperse fans celebrating the Habs' victory over the Vegas Golden Knights well into the early hours this morning. It was shortly before 2 o'clock this morning. Riot police were still working to um, encourage the groups of revelers in downtown Montreal to go home. Tear gas had to be used at one point. City News Time, 9.32. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns. On Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Bork is back. B.R. Bork of Bork News Watch. Good morning. Rob, good morning. Let's get it out of the way. Yes. We can attribute last night's win by the Canadians over the uh, Las Vegas team. The ghost of Gump Worsley came off the bench and saved the day. <laughs> okay. I'm not familiar with the ghost of Gump Worsley. I, the I Gumper, man, he is the uh, backbone of all the goodness that comes to Montreal Canadiens. Okay. And uh, look, it was all hands on deck last night. I, I know you'll talk sports with your with your guests a bit later in the show, but sure, what but, a uh, what a great night! But it are was you? Uh, like, you know, I, I just think Pierre uh, Pierre Bork. You must be a Habs fan, uh, you would think. Uh, well, look, um, <laughs> let me tell you a little story. Like we've talked a lot about my my family and you know politics and everything over the years that you and I have talked. On my mom's side, McNeil. My great grandfather was the um, publisher of the Montreal Gazette, and then went on to to run Canadian Press. But his son, my grandfather, was a sports editor for the Montreal Gazette, and so of course my mom's family is Montreal. My mom's from Montreal, and before there were the Ottawa, the the new generation Ottawa Senators, there were the Montreal Canadiens, and that's what I grew up with. And all of the hockey cards I collected were all about the Montreal Canadiens. Sure. Loved them. Jean Beliveau, uh, Yvan Cournoyer, Larry Robinson, go on and on down the list. The Marvel. Uh, Marvelville, Shabbat, yeah. I'm sorry? The Marvel for Marvelville. Oh, my God. Larry fantastic Robinson, stuff. right? Yeah, 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 Larry, just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, this is exciting. I mean, it's tough for me um, to cheer for the Habs uh, because I'm a Senators fan, and even before the Senators came into the league, I wasn't a Habs fan. I grew up, before I converted to what I call Senatorsism, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up, I was a Bruins fan. I, I cheered for the Boston Bruins. But um, I, I find it, uh, I'm caught up in it. I'm happy for the team because it's a Cinderella story. And who doesn't like a Cinderella story, right? Uh, who, doesn't li- who doesn't like to cheer for the underdog? Um, and that's what this is. And it does kind of take me back to, to 1993. And I remember, you know, them going to the Stanley Cup Finals in 1993 and playing Wayne Gretzky and... Uh, um, it's fun. It's fun. And it's fun that it's a Canadian team in the finals again. And it's, uh, it's fun that their, their, their fans are happy and get to celebrate and pour into the streets. And, uh, not so fun that they're tipping over police cars and, you know, they have to use tear gas and that, that's not so fun, but, um, it's been a great ride, you know? It's been a great absolutely. ride, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And when you start to ask me, uh, you know, with my last name being Bork, if I was a uh, a fan, I was expecting you to say a fan of the Bruins, because of course Ray Bork was one of the great. <laughs> That's stars right. For yes, the he Boston was. Bruins, of course, yeah. for twenty years, right? So yeah. uh, I've got that. Uh, I've got that passion too. Look, uh, Gump Worsley is a is a fabled personality from from years past. Well, and, I know uh, the name, and I, I, you know, and I, I and I, I know. 
kind of the, the, the you know the outlines of his career, but I'm not from you know I I, I couldn't cite you chapter and verse on Gump Worsley. So yeah, Gump Worsley. There's a great picture of him in full full action on our website at Bork.com alongside those who won last night, and it transcends uh, those generations. You see the two together, and it's just terrific. The history of that team. You know, the history oh, yeah. of the Montreal Canadiens, we we don't have that. We don't tap into that here in Ottawa. Yeah, you know, at, in the earliest days, Frank Finnegan and so forth. Uh, but we we have a bit of that history as well. And if I, if I were involved, God forbid I'm not being a hockey guy to begin with, but I'm not here to give advice to Eugene Dumbrick, and it seems Chris Phillips wasn't able to, to, to bridge that gap either. But, uh, you know, you've got a massive amount of history. Not only that, but you've got a ton of great players from the Ottawa Valley, from Ottawa proper, from Gatineau, who've gone through the NHL, right? I mean, where are they? Let's bring them in, those that live in the area. Let's get them involved. Let's rebuild from the ground up. Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, with 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 Ottawa and it's, uh, you know, the issues with the owner and whatnot. I mean, there was a story this week about Chris Phillips leaving the, the foundation and uh, Alfie's not involved with the club. I mean, those are the... You know, those are the two players that they've had their jerseys retired and they're really not involved with the Ottawa Senators at all. Yeah, and that tells you everything you need to know about the current owner, absentee ownership of the of the team. And, that, and, and you know, then they decry and lament the fact that nobody's really paying attention to them. Who can blame? Who can blame the population? My last great interest in the Ottawa Senators, of course, was during that epic run by the Hamburglar. Oh, and he set a record. Right. He set that's a record, right. and look, he can rest on his laurels. That's that's, that's right. my favorite moment. You were all wrapped up into that. I remember that the hamburger. Yeah, Fantastic. You, Fantastic. yeah, and you still bring that up from time to time. They have anybody remember the hamburger? Okay, let's move along. Um, this city council meeting that happened, um, and the fact that you know that there's a Watson Club and there are Watson loyalists, and if you're not a member of the club, you're on the outside looking in. Uh, what's your take on that as a former city councillor, in fact? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so, uh, you know, many cities have, uh, in their municipal politics, they have parties. Yeah. Um, and you, you'll have a leader of the party, Montreal's like that, Vancouver, uh, you know, not so much Ottawa or Toronto, but some many cities. And uh, so if you're part of that party, that you just kind of toe that line the same way you, you see in, in provincial and federal politics. But to get things done, you need consensus, whether you're a ward alderman or you've got uh, greater glories uh, to, to deal with as a, as a committee chair or, or the mayor himself. Look, we saw with Larry O'Brien, and I like Larry a lot, but there were some challenges try, with trying to get consensus of, on some of the big yeah. uh, the big projects that he wanted or he envisaged. Uh, in Jim Watson's uh, way, I'm going to give him credit for this. He, he realizes to get things done, he's got to have consensus. And so that means trading. That means trading. Okay, I need this. You want that. All right, let's figure out how that works. If he wasn't able to do that, if he wasn't able to get consensus, like if I'm Tim Turney, if I'm any number of those so-called Watson people, I'm like, you know, they can go either way if they don't want. If they don't feel they're not getting full value for their constituents, their constituents will remind them of that fact, and they'll either have to change or they'll be changed. And in Jim Watson's defense, and I'm not here for that really, but I'm just saying that you have to build that consensus wherever you find it on every single file. You don't just walk in and say, listen, it's this way or the highway. That doesn't work. That didn't work for Larry. It won't work for no, the no, next no. person who yeah. thinks they can yeah. do it. Yeah, well, during that municipal election, I mean, um, Larry O'Brien won the big job. Congratulations, you're the mayor. But we've also returned every one of the councillors. Yeah, well, that's right, population so, speaking. Yeah, but, you know... Good luck trying, you know, and they don't, they don't, they don't like you, let alone see the world your way. So that was, yeah, that let's, was. Uh, let's not forget that often, often is the case that just a minority of people will vote in municipal politics. Just a minority. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. for a candidate to get elected, they got to figure out where those people are and go and get them to the ballot. Identify them and then get them up to, the, to vote on, on voting day. That's all they have to do. Yeah, I think a lot right. of the councillors, um, you know, the mayor's been around a long time, longest serving mayor in Ottawa's history. And a lot of the, the councillors in the beginning, you can't say this anymore, but uh, at the start of the this latest go around to Mayor Watson, they were brand new newbies to municipal politics. Whereas the mayor had kind of been there and done that. And I think 
for a lot of them. Um, this, you know, they, they, they spent a lot of their career at council saying, well, whatever works for the mayor works for me. But but if it ever stops working for the mayor, they're all in big trouble. Yeah, but so. yes, yes. But also yeah. if it stops working for them, if suddenly, you know, let's say, and I'm going to pick a name out of a hat here. Uh, um, frankly, I can't even think of a name out of a hat. Let's say you're George DeRuz, and I don't yeah. know if you're on the Watson team or not. But yeah, he's a Watson they, guy, yeah. yeah. If, if suddenly Jim Watson in his wisdom says, you know what, the next garbage dump's going to be in George DeRuz's award. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? We're going to clear <laughs> clear out some space for that dump, and that's going to be dump central. Like Jerusalem's constituents are going to say, "George, you're you're out. You're going to sleep. We don't want that. You're being rules here, and that's not what we want." Yeah. Okay. Okay. When you uh, did you go to Catholic school or? Uh, I went to public school. You went to public uh, school. It doesn't matter. It doesn't public. matter. I just see a lot of people asking that question on social media right now. When I was um, when I was going to public school in Nova Scotia, we didn't learn anything about residential schools. W- w- what about you? Did that even come up as like a part of the curriculum or anything? Um, I, I will tell you that it, as far as I can remember, there wasn't a lot of indigenous indigenous history. Number one that was uh, reflected in, in our learning and certainly nothing about residential schools. Like I will nothing, say this, right? That, nothing. No. no. I will say no, this, that no. there were always these rumors about uh, uh, about what what was going on in Rigo. You know, Rigo just before, just after you get to, to the Quebec border on the 417. Oh, okay, yeah. And there, there was some kind of a school there. I don't know if it was a residential for Indigenous people or for orphans or whatever it was, but there were stories you know, that circulated the bad things happened if you ended up going there. And I don't know if it was urban legend or not, but maybe uh, if yeah. if some kind of uh, commission is uh, is struck to, to look at what happened to residential schools and well, other yeah. type facilities, then, you know, orphanages and such. Um, but, you know, it's certainly... Well, that's interesting that you would say that because when I was growing up, it wasn't a residential school. They, they called it a reform school. The bad kids right, went there. And, yeah, reform uh, school. And in Nova Scotia, it was called Shelburne. And it used to be like the boys who came back from Shelburne, you didn't mess with them. No. Um, no. Um, now, in hindsight, I was actually thinking about that the other day. Like, you know, they, if, they, if they went away bad, they came back, even, you know, damaged. Yeah, you and, went for reform uh, and came, you, you went for reform and you came back deformed. You know, damaged, uh, in a way. I mean, damaged, yeah, damaged. you know. Yeah, yeah well, that's it. Yeah. Mentally so, deformed, right? You had yeah. a different view of life and and the cruelties that humans can uh, impose on each other. It's just awful, yeah. absolutely awful. And you wonder how anybody, as a parent myself, you know, anybody listening to us who remembers being a kid, the vulnerability, or or have, having being a parent and having kids, like who would do that? You know, who would do that kind of stuff to kids? These are it's pure madness. What do you think of the whole uh, Bennett, Jody Wilson, Raybould controversy that um, has ignited in the last 24 hours? Do you think anything will come of that? Um, I'm good. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I don't think much is. I think uh, Carolyn Bennett needs to be uh, retreaded. And if I'm a if I'm a liberal MP, and you know, people say, "Oh, this guy's bashing liberals." I actually ran to be a liberal MP, so I don't mind saying this. You know, there are a lot of backbenchers waiting their turn. And surely to God, there are better people who could be a member of the cabinet than some of the ones that are failing in this day and age. And I'm thinking of Harjit Sajan in, in national defense, who seems he, he runs from one calamity to the next. Yeah. And he's, he's as, as asleep as his prime minister is, seems to be on these big files. And Carolyn Bennett, uh, God, I don't know. She's been there too long. Who knows? Maybe she's so insensitive because of, you know, being immersed in the backseat of the limo. You just don't see the reality. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I suspect, as a doctor, she has sensitivities and she works hard. But there, there's a there's a lack of something. Or, you know, Judy Wilson Raybould is. A or she feels black. untouchable. You know, uh, there that, and this has long been an Achilles heel uh, for the liberals. Entitlement, right? This sense of entitlement um, creeps in. You know, you know, I think I've told you this, Rob, uh, an, an MP told me, a longtime Liberal MP told me one day he's, when I was running for Parliament, he says, your friends are not going to be within the party here. They're going to be on the other side of the of the aisle. And and that's because everybody within that, whether it's Carolyn, maybe there's a whole bunch of bad blood behind the scenes between 
uh, Ju- uh, Jody Wilson, oh, I'm sure there and is. Carolyn Bennett. Yeah. And this this is a manifestation, a minor manifestation. Who knows what Carolyn Bennett was saying behind the scenes when Ju- Jody Wilson yeah. and Raybould was teetering at the brink. I, I have to tell. I have to wonder though. When are these liberals going to learn? Don't communicate electronically with Jody Wilson Raybould. Yep. She'll either yep. record it or she'll take a screenshot of it. You yep. haven't learned your lesson yet. Oh, She's yeah. using the modern tools. Right? Yeah, She's sure. Them and, the, sure. and the liberals are back in the uh, late 1990s. Rob, can I dovetail that over to uh, you know the situation with respect to um, uh, to you know to to Aaron O'Toole? And the conservatives. Yeah. yeah. How, how is it that with all of these, I, I use the word calamity in a moment with respect to hard decision, with all of the bad things going back over a year now to the We Charity debacle and that explosion, how is it that the liberals are as high as they are and the Tories are as low as they are? Yeah, what well, the heck's that's going on? The great mystery, isn't it? It's the it great is. mystery. Yeah. Good point, Pierre. Have a wonderful weekend. Same to you, my friend. Enjoy your fishing and your barbecue. Will do. Pierre Bork. Of Bork News Watch coming up next. Habs win off to the Stanley Cup for the first time in ni- since 1993. The world's number one NHL historian and trivia expert, Liam McGuire, on the Rob Snow Show on City News. This hour. It's such a beautiful feel because it's all natural. Um, I'm able to talk to a lot of people who are going through different uh, journeys of health where they really don't know where to start, where to begin. And I'm happy and grateful to have all this knowledge where I can actually help them and guide them. So, um, of course, you know, medications have a great place in our system, but even so do natural therapies, which have been around for centuries and centuries. Like, you know, uh, old time, ancient times, everything herbs grew, everything was done with nature, all healing was done with nature, so I'm totally in love with all the elements with nature. In our beautiful village of Manatic, the Manatic Natural Market, you can find tremendous different things. So we have herbs, we have vitamins, uh, we have natural uh, body care, uh, we do infrared sauna therapy, uh, nutrition counseling, acupuncture, bone therapy, energy healing, so we're like a wellness hub. Uh, along with being a full health food store. We are one year into pandemic since it started last year in March. Um, It was a shock. Usually I see things coming and I definitely did not see that coming. Golden Root is a product that I created uh, four years ago, actually for my kids, uh, just for immune system, overall health. And it just took off with certain friends of mine who had cancer or some severe issues and they started finding that it was really helping them uh, from um, different um, tests they had done with their doctor. And I knew I had something really special. So then I went through the proper uh, procedure of being able to sell it. So it's actually, I'm not allowed to make it anymore in my house four years ago, and it is made in a Health uh, Canada approved lab, and then it comes to me. And what Golden Root is, is a formulation of turmeric, ginger, lavender, oregano, and black pepper, all food grade, which is the most bioavailable turmeric in the market right now for pain, inflammation, digestion, immune system, concussion, liver health, and brain health. So, uh, and it tastes like salad dressing. We do a lot of in-house, so we make our in-house uh, concoctions of teas. Uh, you can come here, tell us what your health issues are, and we can blend it right there. And there's some that are already prepared beforehand for sleeping, for anxiety, for different things. And in that bar, we basically make cold brew teas and cold brew nitrogen coffee. And again, it's uh, all local. Everything we do is local, and as many herbs we can find uh, locally as well. If a car- client can come out, We'll go out our way to deliver it. Uh, and you're getting that personal touch when you come in. If you have an issue, we will listen and help you. We're very, very active in the community, so we would like the same thing back for the community to come to. Seconds in, Petrangelo's had a chance. That hot shot. Looks like it 
caught breaks to the mask. A chance for Pacioretty, and now back the other way. It's to no win. Uh, St. Jean Baptiste Day, like no other, a fet national, unprecedented as the Habs punched their 34th ticket to the Stanley Cup final. Let's go over last night's excitement. Liam McGuire, hockey historian and Habs fan, joins me this morning on the Rob Snow Show. I haven't seen you actually since Hockey Day in Canada, and it's uh, great to have you back on the show, Liam. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be with you, Rob. It's uh, an <clears throat> exciting time, obviously. You've kind of captured it there in a nutshell. It's just been it's just been amazing. We used to take it for granted as kids growing up. You know, the announcement every year to Montreal is the Stanley Cup Parade will take its usual route. And uh, now all of a sudden, 28 years between trips to the final is quite, uh, quite amazing. And to do it in the fashion that they've done it here in the last six, seven weeks has been just unreal. What do you think has been the key to the Habs' success? Because they were not expected to do this well at all. No, they weren't. And and shame on a lot of us for not really grasping. We were just so conditioned to look at these guys, all our athletic superstars and heroes and whatnot, as robots. And this is a group of men like others in the NHL had to do this year due to the pandemic, Montreal had to play their final 23 games in 45 days, Rob. I mean, that, that, there's not even any words to describe how ridiculous that is. And as a result, they, they ended up with three, four, five key players. Hurt Weber, their captain. Carey Price, their goaltender, was concussed. Brendan Gallagher was hurt again, out for a long period of time. Heart and soul of the team, number of others. And they limped into the playoffs, and we just wrote them all off, kind of just kind of forgetting that, you know what, at different times this year, especially at the start of the season, they look like a pretty competitive team. But I'm not saying necessarily that everybody made the wrong call in, in, in them versus Toronto. I still think it was the right call, and the Leafs proved it after four games. They were up 3-1 and won game 4-4-0. Four, four, so when you say what turned it around, I mean, it, it's not like it came right out of the gate that way, but – Carey Price, for sure, rejuvenated, uh, playing like the, the, the guy that we saw from 2014 to 2017. But you want to know the biggest thing? The biggest thing was those eight days they had off after that last regular season game and game one against Toronto where they shocked the hockey world and went into Toronto and got a win uh, with Paul Byron, uh, an Ottawa native, scoring shorthanded in the third period. Then they lose the next three, but they were hanging around in those games. They were competitive. And where everybody thought, Wow, man, what's going on? They should have been enrolled here, nine nothing every game, and and that's where I guess the comment I was making to you, and I put myself in that category too. We're we're saying, geez, we didn't really give them their due at least to be competitive, and then from there, once they won Game Five, there was a switch went off, and we've all seen it in sports. It happened in '93 as well. It it just it, a switch went off, and and they played. I believe I believe they played Game Five for pride, and and when they got that unlikely win. Uh, they played very well, but they blew a lead. They won in overtime, dramatic fashion, and then it's it's just been an absolute tsunami since then. Yeah, and I want to uh, ask you, Liam. You know, I want to I, I want to ask you, Liam, because I remember I remember not the '93 series, um, and there's been a lot of uh, nostalgia, a lot of comparisons be- to this team to to '93, particularly when it comes to the Habs' success in overtime. Uh, what what are there any similarities? What are the similarities, differences, say between this team '93 team? Oh, no, you're hitting the nail on the head there. It's, uh, look, it starts to net, right? I mean, you had the all-world goaltender Patrick Waugh. You got the all-world goaltender and Carey Price. This difference being that Patrick Waugh had played pretty solid in his, what was then his sixth or seventh year, seventh year, I guess, in the NHL. Uh, Carey been, has been in the NHL a lot longer and, and had slipped. You know, he had, but, but right now they're getting great goaltending from Carey. Montreal got great goaltending from Carey Price or from Patrick Waugh in 93. Um, the, the depth through the lineup. The third and fourth lines in 93, guys like Gilbert De, uh, uh, Dion, guys like uh, Di Pietro, Rocky Di Pietro, guys like uh, um, uh, Mike Keane, you know, depth, uh, guys like Gary Lehman, 
came, you know, came over from, from, uh, they went to Toronto to Calgary and, 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 uh, bounced around and ends up with the Habs playing, playing a pretty significant role in a bunch of games. Uh, Danny Savard, uh, until he broke his foot That's in the, in Danny the first Savard. game of the final. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 a lot of utility guys that are being used in similar roles right now in Montreal. The depth through the lineup is very, very similar through the four lines, Rob. So I would say that's similar. You've got the goaltending and, and, uh, and the specialty teams. I mean, the specialty teams got real hot in 93, and right now they're, they're, they've they're set a record for penalty killing in, in, in the history of the National Hockey League. So so those would be the, the most obvious, with the number one by far being the goaltender. I mean, you've yeah, got yeah. Carey Price right now, if Canada goes to the Olympics in, in February, has cemented himself as the starter, and Patrick Waugh was the best goalie on the planet by far. In and really, Liam, when it comes to Carey Price and you think about all all of those great Montreal goaltenders over the history of that club, the only thing really missing from his resume is the Stanley Cup. So, I mean, it's it's huge for him, right? It is, absolutely. It's a massive vindication here. He's been... He's been really, he's been trounced, he's been vilified, he's been virtually condemned here in the last number of years as, as being, just looking like the days are gone. And it, it, his statistics have backed that up. For every game that he played and played well in, or a series of games where he made some sensational saves, they would be followed by bad goals or outcomes where Montreal just didn't get the win and he wasn't a part of helping in any way, shape, or form. I'm not just talking for a month here. This was like a three-year malaise. And and uh, then what happened was, Rob, last year in the bubble, when they, when, they, when they started hockey again, we started it, did the play-in round, we beat Pittsburgh, we, Montreal beat Pittsburgh, and, and then lost to the Flyers. But Kerry played great. So Mark Bergeron said, hey, Man, maybe we do have something here. Let's bring the guys in. Let's ma- let's max out the cap and, and get some guys. And they did. And he made four key acquisitions: Tyler Toffoli, Jake Evans, uh, Edmondson, and and uh, he went and got these guys. And 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 all of a sudden, uh, Josh Anderson. And and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the Canadians came out of the gate the way they did. And I think that rejuvenated Carey to a degree, but we still didn't really see it here. Till the, till the Leaf series, and they had a chance to, of course, he was hurt with the concussion, but till the Leaf series, and they started to turn it around. But this is huge for him. Absolutely. Huge okay. for him on his resume and his career. Who do you think they're going to play in the final? There's a game seven tonight. I, I think Tampa gets it done tonight, Tampa. but okay. uh, I don't know, man. Holy cow. I, I've never had a tougher year. Do you think they can go all the way? Can the, Can the Habs win it all? Well, they certainly can right now. Yeah. I mean, you just beat a very good Vegas team. Uh, you beat a Toronto team that could score. I mean, they lost to Varys, but uh, Winnipeg is just, I mean, yeah, they, they lose Shifley, but they had more than enough ammo, should have on paper, and they swept them. Why would you say, why would anybody say right now that, that, they're, that Montreal for sure are not going to win whoever they're playing. I think that would be a ridiculous statement to make. I mean, Tampa looks like they have flaws in their game, and the Islanders certainly do, but I think it would be whatever you're going to see. First of all, the Islanders, it's like a mirror image. They're a mirror image of Montreal. And if it's Tampa, well, Rob, they're defending Stanley Cup champions. And they're the next Vegas. They're the ones that have the all the ammo, the high power. You got Kucherov if he's not hurt. You got, you know, you've you've got Hedman on D and you've got Vasilevsky in net, who's every bit the goaltender carry prices. So it would be a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus they've got their power play and you've got Montreal's penalty killing. So it would be a really, really immovable object meeting the irresistible force. And it would be a fantastic series, I think. I think Tampa wins at home tonight, but Game seven's baby. This is a hundred. Anything can happen. Anything. In NHL history. So. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> I have been. Brother. Thank you, thank you, Liam. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, Rob. Good yeah, day. yeah, yeah. I love that guy's passion for the game of hockey. NHL historian, trivia expert, Habs fan extraordinaire. That's Liam McGuire. This is the Rob Snow Show. Hey, this is Friday free for all. Our open line hour. Call in at 750-1310. It's wide open on topics. You pick the topics, okay? This is City News. This hour of...
City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, June 25th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 20 degrees. It's 19 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. Two Ottawa police officers charge in an anti-corruption investigation connected to a fentanyl bust that involves one of the officer's family members. Our Jason White has the details. Two Ottawa police constables have been arrested, 45-year-old Mohamed Mohamed and 29-year-old Haider Albadri. The CBC says Haider's wife and brother also face charges. The RCMP's anti-corruption squad arrested two civilians, 29-year-old Mohamed Salama and 29-year-old Ashley Albadri. Both are charged with dealing with a forged document. Ottawa police also raided a home on Holmwood Avenue mid-afternoon yesterday, seizing nearly a kilogram and a half of fentanyl. Police arrested and charged 23-year-old Amir El Badri with several narcotics-related offenses. In a written statement, the police chief says he knows the charges will shake public trust and harm the morale of his officers and staff, but insists this incident does not reflect the overall integrity of his members. Both arrested officers are suspended with pay. The investigation continues. Jason White. City News. City News time, 10.03. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. We may have some more showers as we work through the day. South wind, the high 28 degrees. It'll feel a bit warmer with the humidity. Some showers this evening. We get into that steady rain overnight, 19 for the low. And tomorrow, windy with rain, 25 feeling like 31. More showers and thunderstorms possible for Sunday. For today, the high, 28 And right now in Ottawa, 20 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's 19. We're getting the latest numbers of COVID-19 infections across the province. Seven new cases in Ottawa today, according to the provincial numbers. Those seven out of 256 cases reported province-wide. One new case in both Renfrew and Eastern Ontario's health unit, while Leeds, Grenville, Lanark reporting no new cases. The numbers come from just over 26,500 tests that were completed with a positive rate of 1.3%. There have also been two additional deaths in the province. Today is the last day on the job for the top doctor in the province, David Williams, retiring, drawing criticism for his handling of the pandemic. Williams will be replaced by Dr. Kieran Moore, who was in Kingston but has been training with his predecessor for several weeks now. Florida fire teams worked through the night in the hopes of finding survivors in that Miami area building collapse. 159 people are still listed as missing. The Miami-Dade County Mayor is Daniela Levine Cava. She says three more bodies were pulled from the rubble of the Champlain Towers south. Those three people have not been identified at this time. Uh, It does bring our, our count to four of those who've lost their lives in this tragedy. Now, the 12-story building collapsed early yesterday morning. As mentioned, 159 people still are unaccounted for. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. And it's not Friday free-for-all. That's our favorite hour of the week around here. 750-1310, 750-1310. Let me say that one more time. 613-750-1310. Email therobsnowshow at ottawa.citynews.ca. So during the Friday free-for-all, it's very easy. You call and pretty much talk about any topic that's on your mind. We don't come up with topics. I have topics in case you don't call i always set this hour up uh, under the auspices that nobody's gonna call so that's why when nobody calls i'm i talk and i talk and i talk but uh, during the friday free-for-all i kind of throw caution to the wind and let you come up with the topics and uh we we just do our best to roll with it we prefer topics that have been in the news because we're all kind of news junkies and i assume you're a news junkie or you wouldn't be listening to city news 
But it doesn't have to be in the news. Not a hard and fast rule. Okay, maybe your topic is something that you think should be in the news. We're, we're okay with that, too. 750-1310, 750-1310. Okay. Stittsville. Karen. Good morning, Karen. Hi, is this the one in Stittsville? Yes. In Stittsville. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I love, love your show. There's you a do. few uh, things I'm going to talk to you about. Sure. Okay, the first one is Carolyn Bennett. She should be fired because when she was in opposition, she was calling for the resignations for a lot of other parties for smaller things than what she has done. And she is a member. She is the top person. And it doesn't matter if she's a doctor or anything else. She should resign if she has any values or morals or ethics. Right. And no excuses. Second one is Sajid. He should be fired, not because of his personality and what he did before six no, years ago. But his but performance, his perf- job oh, performance, right? His last six years, I want you, though, to say one good thing he's done in the last six years. He embellished what he did in Afghanistan. He has not helped one military woman. He puts his hands up and he blames a child, a five-year-old child, you would reprimand for that. And when COVID first started, Trudeau was in Africa trying to get the United Nations seat, which he got less votes than even Harper did. He said, you can Google it, that the coronavirus could not come to Canada. And they were all asking him to come back, so he didn't mm-hmm. procure anything. He went to okay. China for I, I'd have to look that up. I don't know if he yeah, understood that. Yeah, but he that, didn't, but, and he uh, went to China for it, and they didn't even... I mean, I, I, I do remember senior officials, cabinet ministers and the like, saying the risk is low. The risk to yeah. Canadians is low. They said that all the time. Yeah, yeah sure they And did. I said yeah. in that March, because I'm working somewhere, I said... We should close the borders. And that was literally, I said that to customers coming in, we should close the borders. But he didn't do that. And the other thing is, is um, if, because I, I t- as you can tell, I talk to a lot of people. I don't say what party I'm for. And I've talked to a lot of liberals. They've come out. They have been liberals for 50, 60 years. Yeah. And they say they cannot stand watching Trudeau's face on TV <laughs> because they know that every word that comes out of his mouth, and they have very strong... Well, I don't know. How do you explain these polls, okay? The two I polls believe, this week. I don't believe... You don't believe the polls. I Is don't. That what you're I believe that they are going to areas because they want to boost it, and right. I'm hoping well, that I when the election maybe. comes, Maybe, maybe. will be shocked. Okay, maybe, maybe. We'll and see. The, There's going to be an election, Karen. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, but yeah. the other thing, why why are they now, the media, get, like I was watching the news, you can tell I watch it, is why are they going on Jody about this? They should be going on Carolyn Bennett, like they said that okay. Jody shouldn't be saying this. Jody said she was. Well, who in the media was saying that? I, I haven't seen anybody in the media say that. Last night. Oh, it was really? on. I watched CTV and CBC. I, oh, I, really? uh, okay. I do that. They were saying, what are the liberals? They said that. Oh, well, said, yeah, okay. you know. Right. But the thing is, is uh, what was that going on? Uh, Jody was harassed by 23, literally 23 liberals to try and persuade. She was doing her job. Yeah. And what's his name? Butts resigned. But he's back in. He's He's calling the shots. That should be illegal. Yeah. I don't know if he's calling the shots. Do these people ever really go away? Karen, um, I, I'm glad you you had your say, but I do have to move along, okay, because okay. the phone lines are jammed, okay? I'm thank glad. you. I'm glad. Thank and you, you're Karen. doing a good job. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being part of the show, okay, and for being tuned in, okay, and paying attention to what's going on out there. Uh, to the West End, David is in the, uh, the West End this morning. He's yeah. uh, up there in the penthouse. He's got the great view of Ottawa. What's going on, David? Well, I just had to send the wife back to the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, David. me too. I mean, yeah. I don't know why they sent her home. Okay. I've no, no, anyway, that's not why I called. Yeah. I got two points. All right. Okay. One is the Globe and Mail. Yes. The Globe and Mail had me until they brought Trump into the picture, okay? Okay. And I can go on about all the things that were done to Trump, but I I do have... Oh, Trump so hard done by. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I I have one point, though. I don't know whether you recognize or or remember seeing this, but uh, Biden was uh, welcomed... Uh, by I think it was a French president with a handshake, and his words were "Welcome to the club." Oh, really? Okay. Yes, that yeah. was on TV. Welcome to he the club. actually said that. Welcome to the club. Macron said that to Biden. Welcome yeah. to the club. Welcome, welcome, to, welcome to, the to the club. club. Okay. That <laughs> says it all. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, it, it saves me going on for an hour. 
Right, right. Okay, right. the other okay. point, Rob, is yeah. the, the minister did not know. Okay, that that was that's being said, right? The minister did not know. You know how they do that, Rob? How do they do that? Okay, I've been to Superior Court a number of times yeah. over the garbage business, right? Okay. Okay. Lawyers, in it, when there's people in a room and something is going to be said, the certain parties will get up, leave the room. What has to be said is said. Then they come back in the room and they have deniability. That's the way it works. Plausible deniability. Exactly. It yeah, happened okay. to me numerous times. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that's the way they get around it. And we, we should. Well, I'll tell you what, when it comes to Mr. Sajan, there's the, a lot of stuff he doesn't appear to know. Well, that's because <laughs> he doesn't want to know. Well, he doesn't want to know, yeah. And when it's said, he's outside the door, they discuss it. They, and they, well, I mean, for example, the former military ombudsman went to him and said, Minister, we've got a problem. Yeah. Okay, we've got a problem. Right. There's been an allegation against a top member of the military. Yes. General Vance. And you know what he did? Yeah. He said, I don't even want to hear about it. Yeah, well, he he, he heard he heard it. Yeah. I don't even want to hear and, about and, it. And, uh, and that, I guess he can... I guess that's it. what passes for leadership. I guess. Yeah. Thanks, I David. Got to go. Thank you. 750-1310 Friday. Free for all. Rob Snow Show. Uh, Gary, good morning, Gary, you're on City News. Good morning, Rob. Hey, Gary. I just want to say something to you. Thank you so much this week. It's been such a great week for the electric buses, whatever. I'm just saying, you fought the fight against all this stuff. You've had terrific guests. Well, it's not even about fighting. It's about just giving yeah. kind of the, you know, even a little bit of the other side of the story here, like some critical thinking here. Why is this happening in the space of two weeks? What kind of do, even care, we should, you know, I, God bless Carol Ann Meehan, Counselor Carol yeah. Ann Meehan. Yeah, you know, but I put it I put it to her yesterday. How can you do your due diligence in two weeks? You're going to spend a billion. Do you have that clip, David? David's going to find that for us, Gary. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, you know, we can't do due diligence in two weeks. But they all voted for it anyway. Yes, I, I know. It's I, I phoned the mayor's office this morning and I left a message. Oh, yeah. And I phoned uh, Teresa Kavna and I left a message for her, too. Like, why did you all vote, you know? It was just... Well, the reason they're horrible. voting for it is because a lot of it is federal government money. Yeah. So they say, well, uh, the, the term they're using is it's been de-risked. Don't you love that term, de-risked? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, been de-risked. It. <laughs> well, it's, it's, somebody's taking the risk because somewhere along the way, a $400 million loan is going to have to be paid back. Yeah, okay. I understand, yeah. <laughs> right. And can uh, I just say one more thing? Yeah. Could we please keep the bicycles off of the sidewalks for the seniors, Amen. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say, yeah, Rob. Good stuff, Thank you Gary. so much. Thank you. Yeah. You have that clip there? No. I, I, I have to ask you, what are you thinking on a billion dollars for electric buses? <laughs> what are you thinking? Uh, two weeks, <laughs> counselors. Two weeks. You learned about this two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You approved it yesterday. I know. That's the not due diligence. Actually, you know, Rob, Rob I, I, I agree with you totally. This is not due diligence, but this... Well, you having, voted having, for having, it. Having well, voted you voted for, for it, Counselor. Well, having voted for climate emergency right. okay. and wanting Thanks. zero... Thanks. Thanks. And that's not meant to embarrass the Counselor. It's just to point out a teeny tiny little bit of a contradiction there. Quarter after 10, Rob Snow Show, Friday Free for All. This is City News. The Rob Snow Show, brought to you. I wanted to give gifts to my volunteers, so I started making, I knew this is a skill I had, so I made a chocolate that had, that had culture, a cultural based uh, with a teaching, because culture here is not just the little part, it's uh, the large part, it's the fundamental part of our, um, our organization. So then we started doing you know just little programs and we sell a few at a fair and then we started getting contracts people were starting to enjoy the 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 the, the chocolates and started getting more and more contracts all across Canada and then we decided to become a social enterprise and we were able to create two jobs and Val is one of our um, uh, uh, chocolatiers very talented 
uh, we were able to help her with uh, employment. We started just with a little bit in the kitchen, doing a little bit of chocolate together, and next thing, it's just kind of taken off. And it's, it's great, because I love doing, to be creative, and we get to create a lot and make up stuff. And it's just a, I just love it. It's just great that we get to make money back for Wabano. And it's helping me out, and we're helping just everybody out, Wabano and everything. <laughs> we met uh, a, a very uh, socially conscious uh, business owner uh, being around town, and we decided to, to uh, partner because beans and chocolate, uh, I mean, coffee and chocolate uh, are sort of created the same way. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, and they're very, you know, uh, one, uh, one uh, origin uh, bean, you know. So uh, it was a good pairing together. And, uh, and it's, it's been a fantastic partnership for both of us. I was fortunate enough to get introduced to Purat the head of Wabano Fine Chocolates uh, through a local uh, networking group. And I was completely intrigued by the social enterprise that she was running. And, and then I looked at what we were doing, trying to support local business and supporting um, local communities. And it, just, it was a perfect match and it's been fantastic ever since. We make every batch by hand. We temper it by hand to get to the consistency it needs to be to make a good chocolate. And one of the best, also wonderful things we did, we have connected with Ed, with being around town, and our coffee bars have been an amazing hit. So we're really excited about the connection with our, with our coffee. Friday free for all. Wide open on topics. We'll just keep rolling with the phone call. Blackburn Hamlet, Chris, you're on City News. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Chris. Yeah, it's been disappointing to see the news about Jan Harder. Yeah. She's been a great counselor for 20 years, and it's uh, sad to see her career you know, maybe ending next year with this ethical breach over her head. Yes, yes. But I was yeah. listening to the comments from Diane Deans uh, earlier this week, and I asked myself the question, okay, uh, Diane Dean, she has run for the nomination in Ottawa South for uh, the Ontario Liberals and the Federal Liberals. So would she be that hard on her federal leader right now, who has had several ethical breaches to his name? Why, why all this righteous indignation against Jan Harder but how, would, how does she feel in her private conversation with right, right, right. the Prime well, Minister? Um, interesting. Okay, because there was, uh, it was uh, quite an exchange th this week at the council meeting between Diane Deans, who may or may not have ambitions to be mayor of Ottawa someday. There have been rumors that she may run for mayor. Um, but she put it to Mayor Watson, do you think, the, uh, Mr. Mayor, that Jan Harder's in a conflict of interest because you're trying to water down her sanction. Let's listen to the exchange here. Well, I, I guess I'd like to start by asking you, Mr. Mayor, do you accept the recommendation or the advice of the integrity commissioner that Councillor Harder was in a conflict of interest? Uh, my uh, motion is a replacement motion. I support all that is in the replacement motion. Seconded so by Councillor Elshin. Just, just a yes or no. Do you believe that Councillor Harder was in a conflict of interest? Yes or no. Again, I'm supporting the motion that I've put forward, uh, which is a replacement motion of the Integrity Commissioner's report. Like the mayor wouldn't even say, "I, yeah, she's in a conflict of interest." He he couldn't even bring himself to say it. Chris, no. Yeah, so I, I'm just looking at the inconsistency though of people who will hold certain people to a high standard and others just uh, get away with whatever they get Give away others with. a pass. Give others a pass. That's right, yeah, because okay. they're on the right team, of course, so. Right, okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if it, I don't think it was Ottawa South where she ran for the Liberal nomination. If memory serves, I think she ran for the Liberal nomination in Ottawa Centre. 
and lost uh, the nomination to Yasser Nakfi, who went on to become the liberal MPP and the attorney general. And his name has come up uh, as a potential candidate for mayor of Ottawa. We'll see. It's going to be an interesting uh, year in municipal politics. Corey in Ottawa. You're on City News. Corey, good morning. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Hi, Bob. Hi, Corey. Nice to Thank hear you your for, voice today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your show. I'm glad you recognize my voice now. I just want to say I am sick and tired of both levels of government not being accountable for what they say and do. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're coming out of a pandemic, and they're going around buying trains, electric trains. Electric this buses, is, yeah, electric, electric buses. buses. Yeah, yeah. Electric buses, yes. Yeah, we already got the electric chains. <laughs> okay. <I'll laughs> We're buying some more of those, too. Don't you worry. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that isn't the budget only so much anyway? So if they're squandering money, mm -hmm. they're not accountable for for it. What does he do? What does Trudeau do? Go into a back room and print more? I don't know. I have no clue. I'm just sick and tired of hearing all the crap and then them not being accountable. And then if you happen to dare to say something against Trudeau and his government, you're in shit. Okay. You're in big... Be, be, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful with the words yeah, that you use. Okay? Yeah. You can't use that okay. word on the radio, okay? Just don't okay. use that word. And And... Um, I mean, I'm a Canadian citizen, yep. lived all my life in Canada, I uh, just had a birthday, so I'm not a young person, I'm getting up there. Happy belated. And, uh, you know, it just bewilders me. I've got to live within my budget. Yes. Why don't they have to live within their budget? We need affordable housing yes. for, the, for the poor. Oh, oh, all right? oh, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned affordable housing. Um Corey, I've got to point this out. I have to mm -hmm. point this out, okay? Yeah. So there was a report this week from the National Capital Commission. We need $175 million to fix up the official residences in Ottawa, to bring yeah. them up to snuff, you know, worthy of someone, uh, you know, like the governor general or the leader of the opposition or the prime minister. $175 million um, <laughs> for nine for nine residences, okay? Yeah. So then, uh, the same day that there's a news report about that, there's a news event, and it's uh, the minister responsible for affordable housing, Hussein, makes this announcement. We're going to spend $165 million over 10 years to do repairs to 11,000 uh, social housing units in Ottawa. So mm -hmm. this works out. This works out to be, think about this, $1,500 per unit, okay? Mm -hmm. Per unit in repairs in Ottawa over 10 years. So somebody who's living in this, uh, let's break this down and say what this really is, okay? Big election goodie. This means over the next 10 years, the federal government is willing to put $1,500 worth of repairs into one social housing unit in Ottawa, mm -hmm. in your social, in 10 years, mm -hmm. in 10 years, 150 bucks a year in repairs for your mm -hmm. social housing unit. What do you get for 150 bucks? Um, mm -hmm. I just, I, I actually just bought a new toilet for my house and why I couldn't, it was $220. Uh, couldn't yeah, even get yeah. a new toilet for 150 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, and it's just, it's just uh, uh, crazy, crazy to be crazy, crazy to be yeah. thinking yeah. that you know all of this other stuff is more important. We're always going to be talking about the budget, yes, right? Yeah, but if they spent the money in a more why to be more wise about it. The people wouldn't have that much more to be complaining about. Yeah, thank you. But he's not. But he's not accountable to what he says. The comparison to what he does, right? Yeah. I got three boys. I wanted to raise my three boys to be good men one day, right? Sure. I made them all accountable. Good. Don't walk into the house and say, you know, Johnny down the street hit me, and I'm mad at him. Okay, well then, excuse me, son, but what did you do first? 
Did you push him first? Did you hit him first? Hmm. You know, uh, did you, uh, you know, not kick him the ball first? Something. Be accountable. They're not accountable for anything. And Trudeau really dislikes it very, very much when the media or now the Internet, if you say anything over the Internet about Trudeau, he doesn't like it. And it's crazy. It is totally crazy. This pandemic has cost the uh, uh, Canadians how much more uh, dollars? We're still coming out of it. Well, the deficit's four hundred billion. Well, it's going to be in the trillions by, by the time. And we're the debt finished. is now one point three trillion. Yeah. So, yeah. And my girlfriend and I, we get on the phone and we go, "This is wrong. That's wrong. This is wrong. That's wrong." Yeah. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? And I go, "I'm just sick of it." I said, "I can't even." Well, you know what I think, Corey? Anymore. I think me. And you and your girlfriend should run the country. <laughs> All right, we, I, I've got to go. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't, isn't that a nice contrast, though, David? Nine homes for the politically connected. The government needs $175 million to fix up nine homes. Sure, that seems right? reasonable. And then does a big fancy photo op, $165 million, so less money to do repairs on 11,000 homes. For the little people. They've got your back. Yeah, they got your back. All right. We've got halftime here on the Talk Back Hour Friday Free For All Rob Snow Show. City News. The Rob Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 21 degrees in Smith Falls, 19. And here's what's making news right now. Seven cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa today. That's according to provincial numbers and no new cases in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. There is one new case in Renfrew, also one in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. Now across Ontario, 256 is the case count today. The numbers come from just over 26,500 tests done with a positive rate of 1.3%. There have also been two additional deaths from COVID-19 in Ontario. 159 people, the number still listed as missing now in that building collapse in Miami from yesterday morning. Three more bodies were pulled from the rubble of the collapsed condo building this morning, bringing the official death toll to four. Montreal police expected to release information today about the number of people arrested in the rioting last night because the Montreal Canadiens won. 
Some fans celebrating that overtime victory over the Vegas Golden Knights got rowdy. They assaulted police, vandalized vehicles. Police did launch tear gas to disperse the crowd. They arrested several people. The Habs are in the Stanley Cup final for the first time since 93, playing the winner of tonight's Game 7 between Tampa Bay and the New York Islanders. City News Time, 1031. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Friday free-for-all. You pick the topics. We don't pick the topics. And it's a free-for-all. Paul in Ottawa. You're on City News. Good morning. Hi, Rob. Hi. Um, I just want to point something out. Um, this current council, um, they had a vote when on stage two LRT, and they had to rush that vote. The councillor members didn't even get to look at the contract when they were voting on that second stage of LRT. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, and um, like, w- and then they're rushing a judgment to like, you know, like you said, two weeks to look over this um, this bus contract. Um, even though I heard um, that uh, our trans the. Um, one of our transportation uh, people in the city was talking uh, to other people as far back as six months ago. So 16 months ago. I had the CEO of Hydro Ottawa on yesterday, and he said they were talking 16 months ago. Yeah, so, like, to me, that's extremely concerning when you have these sort of, like, mega-large, unprecedented large contracts being, you know, uh, given out. But it seems that our councillors are being rushed to judgment or even like contracts hidden from them yeah, yeah. like and those are the basic facts um and that just really concerns me like well then uh, as and councillor mckinney she voted for this yesterday but she told me you know because she's been pushing for electric buses and i mean not just ele- and at you know that's her she you know she's elected to push those issues what have you right uh her constituents love her for it fair enough not just electric buses. She wants electric fire trucks and electric garbage trucks and everything else, right? Climate emergency. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that every contract you uh, you can look into that involves electric buses and and fire trucks makes it a good deal. Like I I want when I went shopping for my car, I had like a wish list and, and what I was practically sure. looking for, yeah. and I looked for the best deal, and I came across some really crappy ones too, and I came across some really uh, good ones, um, and I know I. I mentioned this before in another call, and, and you're like, oh, you're, you're going a little bit too far with it. But, you know, these type of actions, um, you know, they make me start suspicion, uh, suspecting corruption going on. And I can't prove it. I, I understand that. But, right. you know, it, it, isn't it prudent to think that way? Like when, when, when you're seeing these these, these well, you should, it, 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 I think it's good to be critical. I think it's good to be skeptical. I guess my only point is, uh, Councillor McKenney was asking, John Manconi, can we not like, look into buying some electric buses? And John, at the time, uh, John Manconi was very apprehensive that he, he, you know, well, not a proven technology, don't think it'll work very well. In fact, we have the clip from yesterday. Roll the Vote tape, please. So on the buses, on the buses, I actually was the one that brought the inquiry that got all of this started about a year and a, a year and a half ago, and came back with a report uh-huh. that made the case for electric buses. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, you know, then the mayor took it over. And oh, they stole your idea. The there, you're saying. Well, you know what? They told me no, it couldn't be done. Yep. Um, and the mayor <laughs> asked for a subsequent report. It could right. be do- done at that point. But you told know what? me no, so it couldn't be done. And that was the prevailing opinion at the time. And all of a sudden, if apparently if the federal government is willing to give you whatever they're giving you, $800 million, then all of a sudden it's, well, it, it, it's going to work like a charm. Yeah, but <laughs> is, is it not possible that we will get caught with unforeseen expenses related to this? Like, it's totally possible. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this idea, oh, it's it's free money. Not only is that like uh, faulty logic being that there is really only one taxpayer. Um, the other, if we if we get this, what are the other cities going to get from the federal government? And, you know, essentially it comes from the, from the same spot. But, you know, the track record of our uh, of of transportation in Ottawa is horrible. Like, you know, any time they throw a number at you, you may as well double or, or, or triple it. And where is that money going to come from? It's it's. And that's like I, I'm, yeah. I'm concerned. I'm a lifelong person from be. Ottawa. I think you should be. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, well, okay. thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. Enjoy your weekend. Yep, thank you. 
Uh, so for the first time this morning, we have some available phone lines. Uh, one, two, th- three lines available there. 750-1310, 750-1310. I-, I love it when you bring up topics that w- we've been really hammering away on all week. Um, and w- when it comes to the electric bus, it's, it's been a couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks since it was revealed. Um, Barry in Ottawa. You're on City News, Barry. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Morning, Barry. I found it kind of funny that uh, all these uh, allegations or whatever about Jan Harder that uh, great when she's, uh, you know, resigning from the board or whatever, the transportation. Planning committee, Barry. Planning committee. Planning committee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's quite appropriate that she resigns from the planning committee and gives up all that. And then she, you know, then she praises Ottawa for being the go oh, the greatest place to live, and I wouldn't live any other place and stuff like this. And you know, uh, you know, she's praising the city, and yet here she is, you know, high up in the planning committee. And it made me think. Well, I guess she doesn't uh, hear anybody when they're complaining about the road conditions or uh, you know other problems in the city, whether it's right. bike lanes or. Bad roads. Well, that would be more of the that would be more in the purview of the transportation committee, Barry. Well, maybe they've got too many committees that aren't. Maybe, maybe, maybe they do. Maybe they do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because we all, you know, in addition to having a transportation committee, we also have a transit commission, which is separate from a transportation committee, right? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So so many committees, they're lost in their committees. Yes, yes. yes. I also wanted to say that these electric buses, I think they're just. uh, I think they're uh, jumping into the jumping into the lake without <laughs> seeing how cold the water is. All I will say is I read a news report. I read it on the air yesterday. The state of California pretty much has the same population as Canada. Okay. The entire state of California, when you look at all of their public transit systems in all of the municipalities, this news report said they have 150 electric buses on the roads in the state of California. And they only have 650 e-buses on the road in the entire United States of America. We've gone out, we're going to buy 450 of them in five years. We're going to buy 74 next year. And I would remind you what they cost, okay, along with all the infrastructure that goes along with just the bus. You know, you need the charging infrastructure. It's 2.2 million a bus, okay? Green, sure. Although they will have diesel heaters on them, they will have di- so they're not truly zero emission when you're using fossil fuel to, to make sure the passengers don't freeze when it's minus twenty five outside. <laughs> not truly carbon free there, um, but a traditional diesel forty foot bus, the city of Ottawa could probably buy brand new from New Flyer for five hundred six hundred thousand dollars. These buses with the charging infrastructure, 2.2 million. And the head of Hydro Ottawa said yesterday, it can take four hours to charge. And they're not going to have charging stations at the roadside. They're all going to be charged at the Saint Laurent bus garage, which multiple news reports that I have read say that is a, a recipe for disaster. To rely on having an entire fleet of electric buses having to be charged at either the Saint Laurent bus garage or colonnade um, is a real roll of the dice, and they may want to look into that. That what you really are going to have to have are multiple mini charging facilities scattered all throughout the city, especially along the busiest, longest routes, in order to make the most of these buses. And I guarantee I've done more due diligence than your city councillor has on this file uh, in Hammond. Erica, good morning. Oh, good morning. Hi. 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 Um, so many things to talk about. Yes. But, <laughs> um, I just want to talk about the millions of dollars for the buses, I guess, is one of my topics. Yeah. Uh, you know, this money could have been spent so much more wisely okay. on in the bus structure system. They could have put the money towards uh, putting out recycled garbage cans outside of the bus shelters. They could have put styrofoam padding on the metal seats that we have to sit on waiting for the buses so we don't get hemorrhoids. 
they could have put heaters in the shelters using solar power, you know, so that we don't freeze in the in the winter waiting for the buses to come. Um, I, I don't understand why they haven't made ridership their priority, and they but they've made you know the environment. The environment. The the, ta- what, what comes out of the tailpipe is the priority for that. Yeah. The people that want to ride the bus have difficulty getting choosing to ride the bus because riding the bus is uncomfortable. You know, you see women huddled in the cold with uh, cars driving past, splashing their their baby buggies and their groceries and whatnot, and and elderly people with. But with canes and whatnot and walkers getting on the buses and they're all getting splashed by the traffic that's on the roadside because they can't get into a shelter, there isn't a shelter at the roadside, or they're freezing freezing cold waiting for buses that are delayed or whatnot. And it's like, put some solar on top of each shelter, get some lighting in the shelters, get some heat in the shelters for us, put some padding on the seats for us. I mean, standing for a bus down... Imagine how much of that we could do with a billion dollars there. Yeah, standing downstairs waiting for the the train in that cave of a place. uh, There's no place to sit. Everybody stands like a a massive buffalo waiting for the trains to arrive. (laughs) There's no heating. There's no... Half the time... You're herded. You're being herded around. uh, Yeah, and half the time the escalator going down to the buses is not working at the sail around station. So you have to walk down the escalator. I mean, these things need to be looked at. Why not install UV light at the entrances and exits of both of all of the buses so that the UV light can destroy any viruses that are coming on the buses potentially that would make ridership increase knowing that there was increased safety obsess uh, obsess less you're saying over um the emissions of the vehicle and make the vehicles more comfortable and the experience of actually riding public transit more comfortable i think it's a great point that you make i mean we thank you our the rate of sure bus fare is increasing Exponentially. To yeah. What's a what's a what's a pass for a month cost? What's a what's a monthly pass now? One hundred and twenty bucks, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, like, Erica, I gotta go. Thank oh, you. Thank oh. you. All right. Yep. Gotta run. Um, Paul in the Byward Market wants to talk not about buses. Those those e-scooters. You're on the kick about the e-scooters again, right, Paul? <laughs> What has got you up? What's got you up about the e-scooters again? Well, no, I have to give kudos to your previous caller, Gary. Okay. Uh, His final comment was um, having to get the bicycles off the sidewalks. Yeah. And that was that's been my point all along with this um, this this you know. Uh, testing of these e-scooters. It's the second year, and now this year they've got penalties where you can get a fine of up to $150, I believe, if you are caught riding. Yeah, not only that, you won't be able to use them anymore. They can electronically block you from using them, as I understand. Why is not that being enforced? You don't think it's being enforced? I've yet to see, and I'm still okay. looking right. to see if anybody has. So when you're out and about in the Byward Market, are you seeing e-scooters on the sidewalk? Are you seeing them th- uh, just kind of left willy-nilly because um, that's not They're supposed to be like that? willy-nilly and early in the morning because I take my dog out early in the morning to avoid people and you sure, know, have sure. quiet yeah. time and whatnot. Yeah. And I see them being dropped off. Like, what do you mean being dropped off? Uh, well, uh, reset in the morning and I oh, guess, okay. or whatever. Like the, you know, they they'll line them up three or four or sometimes five at a time in different areas in front of uh, the Royal Mint or in front of the the cathedral or in front of the museum and whatnot. And it's like, why are they being dropped off on the sidewalk if they're not allowed there? When you initiate the scooter and wanting to go. You're on the sidewalk. Most people will want to go to the nearest intersection or, you know, slip down to get onto the, if they want to comply, but they still have to start their ride on the sidewalk. I think it's a wrong thing and or because it's just here on the market pretty much from what I understand. Yeah. Enforce it more. Enforce it, it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Is that your experience, David? Because this was um, this was driving you crazy for a while there in your downtown palace. 
Uh, have things got any better with the e-scooters? Are you seeing them littered all over the place downtown? Or what? It's gotten uh, worse. It's, it's gotten much worse. worse. Remember, when, remember when John Manconi was retiring, he announced his retirement, we had him on, and he said, oh, Rob, we're getting a lot more of those, those e-scooters. Yeah, they they yeah. must have doubled the, the, the concentration of these things. And there's different brands now. There's three or four different colors. Yeah. And they're all over the darn place. I saw one the other day. I was trying to get into the grocery store, and someone hopped off one and left it basically in the middle of the doorway to the grocery store. Oh, my gosh. I'm telling you, it's it's a hazard. It's a public safety hazard. You know, what I see, what, what, um, and it worries me, you don't have to wear a helmet when you ride these things. You don't have to, no. Right? Gosh, it's, and they're on the street, and, um. Ripping around through Rip, traffic, ripping down, around through up traffic, down Algon yeah. Street on the bridges. Oh, They're I see. Everywhere. Yeah, I see them on Laurier. Just zip, 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 and uh, no helmets on. It's just for somebody. It's not going to have a happy ending. I'm afraid. Um, Ten forty-seven, talk back hour. Chris, Ron, Mike, take your calls when we come back. This is City News. The Ron. Part of the reason I got back back into this is because um, I am creative and I also wanted to kind of have a fun flair, 50s vibe. All of the boxes are kind of fun names. The colors are fun. The logo is fun. And it, it's not just the package that I want to bring joy to people's lives. It's also the feeling that they get when they receive it to know that there's someone that thinks of them and they're missing them and showing that they care when they can't be there. The smallest of the subscription boxes is the red box, the classical box. So you would get five to seven items from the variety of categories. Those do change quarterly. However, with items that are more popular, we'll bring them back as people ask for them or you could get them as an add-on option. And then those items will be included in the jazzy box, the same items from the first, although they'll be in a larger size, more quantity, as well as a couple extra items. And then in the largest box, the Duop Deluxe, which is our most popular, that is a comprehensive offering of all of the other two boxes plus additional. So for example, if you were to get a certain item in the smallest of the boxes, that item would still be offered in the large, but in in a bigger size. So you're getting everything bigger plus an extra few items. The first thing is I look for Canadian suppliers and manufacturers. That is something I'm very proud of. I make sure that the products are safe, um, that they fit into the packages that we offer, obviously. They have to be the proper size and weight. Um, I have approximately 300 items that we have so far that we can order that basically help um, make people's lives easier. There's snacks, there's self-care items, there's entertainment, a little bit of everything. And basically I try it and test it and if it's duly approved, then I include it in our packages. So some of the categories that we have is we offer treats, which is of course everyone likes treats no matter how old you are. So we have things like nuts, uh, chocolates, different types of snacks, maybe a handmade piece of jewelry. We also include pieces of jewelry as well, occasionally. Uh, We also have our pamper items. So your pamper items would include things like your bath soaks, your uh, specialty uh, lotions, things like that. Two other categories we offer are leisure. Leisure would include things such as puzzles, adult coloring books, paint by numbers, crosswords, word find, Sudoku, if that's how you say it. Um, And we also have items for self-care and health. So masks, sanitizers, sanitizing wipes. They're all natural, non-drying, made with natural ingredients. So they're very, um, they're very good for everyone, especially in this time that we're dealing with. Uh, nine minutes or so. So let's get to it. Final quarter of the talkback hour. Mike in Canada, you're on City News. Mike? Hey, Rob. Happy Friday. Thank you, sir. Same to you. What's on your mind? Well, first, I'd just like to say good work on the due diligence for the billion dollar. Well, we'll see what happens um, with it. Fingers crossed, I guess, at this point. We're buying them. So there we go. 
Well, I'm just going to say if uh, Bob Shirelli does enter the mayor race and he does win, and if it doesn't work out, he could always use his uh, old Tim Hortons saying for the canceled gas plant. Remember, it was just going to cost Ontarians a cup of coffee. Cup of coffee a day. Yeah. 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 But I guess for us Ottawans, it'd be maybe Tim Hortons for a week. (laughs) <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, you know, Bob Shirelli's been very active on Twitter lately, and he's saying, well, okay, um, you're going to put a billion dollars to our electric buses, but you've been promising for years and years people in Canada and people in Barhaven light rail, okay, that they would be served by the third phase of light rail. But there's no funding agreement in place yet. Where's the money for the third phase of, of, of light rail? What, what about the people in Canada and Barhaven? They're paying big property taxes for a light rail system that right now ends at Tunney's Pasture. <laughs> Tunney's Pasture. <laughs> Maybe oh, yeah. in 1930, Tunney's Pasture was the West End, okay? Uh, when we had streetcars in Ottawa, the streetcars went further west than light rail goes west right now. Mike, for crying out loud, this is ridiculous. Oh, it is. I'll be long retired before it comes out to Canada. But how can, but how can this be justified that you would, you would have taxpayers in Canada and Barhaven paying for a light rail system that's not even servicing them? Meantime, you're going to spend a billion dollars on buses. If the federal government is going to come forward with, with transportation money for the city, the priority in this city for years has been phase three of light rail. That, yeah, good point, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Cup, whatever it is, cup of coffee a day. Starbucks uh, Frappuccino, three squirts. Uh, Ron in Barhaven. Ron. Yeah, good morning, Ron. Yeah, uh, hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. What's up, man? Uh, I'm, well, I am just spoke to David, and he confirmed that Eric passed away. He did, yes. Um, and, yeah. and I think he was a, a wonderful contributor to the show. Yeah. I know I'm really going to miss him. He, he called out a lot of the sh- shenanigans that were going on. And, and it's just it just ruined my week when I when, when I heard this. I, I I that's you know I'm sorry. We will I, miss I, we will miss taking Eric's call. We will indeed, uh, sir. Yes, we yeah. will. Yes, we um, will. And now the the bus situation and the light rail situation and 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 Trudeau with the backdoor money to his buddies at we and all that. Is there any politician that has the 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 guts to to I think all elected officials should be under a, a, a perpetual forensic audit. I, I mean, you, you talk, there's no proof about fraud or whatever. Yeah. But who, who's looking? Who's looking? Okay. Well, okay. All who's, right. who's keeping track of all that? Nobody. And, and we don't know what's going on. We, it's just what the media tells us, and that's if the media feels like actually checking into something. I, I, like I said, I, this has to stop. Has to stop. Okay. This kind of stuff has to stop. Yeah. Yep. Good enough. Good enough. Well, I mean, I'm really looking forward to our interview after the 11 o'clock news about the Trudeau liberals taking the Speaker of the House, who is a liberal MP, they're taking the Speaker of the House to court over secrecy of documents. And our guest after the 11 o'clock news is a former Speaker of the House, Andrew Scheer, former leader of the Conservative Party. Don't miss that. Who's up next here? Who's been waiting? Uh, it's Chris in Almont. Good morning, Chris. Hi, Rob. Hi, Chris. I think the Winnipeg lab business with taking the uh, speaker to court. Yeah. And uh, that's linked to Wuhan. Well, in obviously America, it is. Now, yeah, I mean, that's been in the media lately. That uh, yep. they were funding gain research in Wuhan. It's all coming together, and I think they really have something to hide. Well, clearly, there's something they don't want to. They, they don't want the public to know about, and they don't want our allies to know about. They say it's about our national security, but uh, and not only that, they say it could harm our reputation as a reliable security partner, sir. <laughs> yeah, and who would that harm? Ooh. be directed against? Man, oh man, oh man. Who uh, you know? Who doesn't get along with the Americans? Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, China doesn't get along with the Americans. Russia doesn't get along with the Americans, right? Neither does Trudeau. Yeah, yeah. And Okay, Chris, thank you. I, I mean, it's just, why would they go to such lengths? Okay. 
Why would they go to such lengths to keep those documents hidden that they would take their own Speaker of the House to court to keep them hidden? Darlene. Good, Good morning, morning, Darlene. Yes. Yeah. Um, this light, uh, the electric buses. Yeah, the it, yep, It's yep. comparable completely to the disaster of light rail, and both will continue to be disasters. And I want to tell you that a few summers ago, I would have to get up. I chose to get up and take my grandson to work. And that was at four in the morning down on Preston Street. Yeah. And I thought, what is this? (laughs) All these elderly people out at that time pushing their walkers, some of them. They were out getting fresh air before they had to go back into their houses in the summer and practically suffocate from the heat. Poor people. So you compare spending a billion dollars, and I won't swear on this disaster, upcoming disaster. Right which was done in about a week, so I'd say no consultation. No consultation. No, not even an hour of public consultation. Darlene, I wish you had called earlier because we're we're right out of time. And Dudley, I would have loved to take your call, but you'll have to call earlier next time in the hour because uh, we're, we're a little up against the clock here on the Rob Snow Show. Andrew Shear, a former conservative leader, former Speaker of the House, is my guest right after the 11 o'clock news. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, June 25th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 2119 in Smith Falls, here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Seven new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa today. That's according to provincial figures. Those seven out of 256 cases announced province-wide. There's one new case in both Renfrew and Eastern Ontario's health unit. Leeds, Grenville, Lanark reporting no new cases. The numbers come from just over 26,500 tests done. The positivity rate 1.3%. 
There have also been two more deaths in Ontario from COVID-19. The province here is offering faster second COVID-19 vaccine doses to more people starting tomorrow. Anyone between the age of 12 and 17 but who live in a hotspot for the Delta variant can book a faster appointment. That starts at 8 in the morning. Now, no region in our immediate area qualifies for that, but all adults in the province who receive their first dose of an mRNA vaccine can book accelerated second appointments. That begins on Monday. The change means about 1.5 million people in Ontario eligible for the accelerated second dose. City News Time, 1101. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. It may have some more showers as we work through the day. South wind, the high 28 degrees. It'll feel a bit warmer with the humidity. Some showers this evening. We get into that steady rain overnight, 19 for the low. And tomorrow, windy with rain, 25 feeling like 31. More showers and thunderstorms possible for Sunday. For today, the high 28. And right now in Ottawa, 21 degrees, 19 in Smith Falls. The Prime Minister expected to face a lot of questions today about the tragic discovery of 751 unmarked graves at a former residential school in Saskatchewan. City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney with more. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs is the latest group calling on Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett to step down after she sent an inappropriate text message to an Indigenous MP. Former Liberal Cabinet Minister, now Independent, Jody Wilson-Raybould had sent out a tweet calling for more federal action on residential schools, not an election. Afterwards, Minister Bennett sent her a text message asking pension, suggesting Wilson-Raybould didn't want an election in order to hit the six-year mark as an MP to qualify for a public pension. Bennett has apologized, but the Union of Indian Chiefs has sent out an open letter saying this text perpetuated racial stereotypes, was an attempt to silence a powerful Indigenous voice, and the minister should resign. Along with questions about Bennett's future, the Prime Minister may also be asked about Canada Day as calls grow to cancel celebrations out of respect for Indigenous peoples. The hair the Heritage Department has signaled to me that there are no plans to change the program for this year's celebration, which is being held virtually due to COVID. Cormac McSwinney, Parliament Hill. City News Time, 1103. Rescue operations entering day two now. Firefighters sifting through the rubble of a collapsed building in South Florida. The mayor of Miami-Dade says 159 people are listed among the missing, either in the collapsed building or somewhere else safe. As they continue the hunt, crews are holding on to one thing. We have hope. Miami-Dade Assistant Fire Chief Ray Jadala says his crews are listening for signs of life. Every time that we hear a sound, we concentrate in that area. So we send additional teams utilizing the devices, utilizing uh, K-9, utilizing personnel. He and the other rescue workers refuse to give up on the possibility of finding more survivors. Jim Ryan, ABC News, Surfside, Florida. The Ottawa police crackdown that began May 1st called Project Noisemaker has so far issued 1,166 charges. They're all related to traffic stops for things like excessive noise or speeding or stunt driving. Several areas of the city known for attracting speeders had an increased police presence. Didn't stop 57 people from getting stopped for stunt driving, 476 others charged with speeding, and as mentioned, a number of other charges as well. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. The Trudeau Liberals are taking the Speaker of the House of Commons to court. It's unprecedented. It's never happened before in Canadian history. And the Speaker of the House is vowing to fight it. And, uh, you know, I've said it twice. I'll say it a third time. Bravo, Mr. Rhoda. And Mr. Rhoda is a liberal MP. He's the Speaker of the House. And it all has to do with the, the incredible revelations about the government lab in Winnipeg, which, you know, day after day is, is sounding more and more like the stuff of Tom Clancy novels with scientists having security clearances revoked and, and uh, scientists fired. Virus is sent to the Wuhan Institute in China. What was it all about? What, 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 what was going on in that lab? Why won't the Liberals release these documents? Why are they taking the Speaker of the House of Commons to court him? Why is that unprecedented? It's a great pleasure to have back on the Rob Snow Show this morning. Andrew Shear, former leader of the Conservative Party and a former Speaker of the House of Commons. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks very much for having me on the show. 
this has never happened before in the history of the country that uh, the the governing party, um, the Liberal Party, uh, in this case, has taken the Speaker of the House of Commons to court over a Speaker's uh, ruling and, and over a vote that has happened in Parliament. Why is this so unprecedented? Why is this unprecedented, Mr. Scheer? Well, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, this is just a bombshell uh, revelation that the government has done this. You know, you think back to medieval times and there's always uh, stories told to speakers about how back in those days, uh, the kings used to come in and chop off speakers' heads when they didn't like the rulings or they didn't like what was being said. I guess we have the the modern day equivalent where the government's going to take the speaker to court and and thereby the, the House of Commons. The reason why this is so unprecedented is because Every government up until Justin Trudeau has recognized the right of parliament to get to the bottom of issues, to hold the government to account, to provide that transparency and oversight. Every single other government uh, in Canadian history has respected that to to one degree or another. And, And here is Justin Trudeau saying that, once again, the rules don't apply to him, that he doesn't have to be bound by that oversight and by that accountability that the House of Commons provides. Okay, so I, I want, because you have the, the, the experience here, you've had the job of Speaker of the House of Commons. When you're Speaker of the House, what are, your, what, what are you in charge of? What, what are your responsibilities as Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, Mr. Shear? Sure. Well, uh, a big part of the job is uh, an administrative role overseeing the precinct. For any of your listeners who have gone on tours of Parliament Hill or have gone to visit their member of Parliament or sat in on question period, there's a lot going on. There's a a lot of uh, public servants who keep the place running, uh, and, uh, and the Speaker oversees all of that. The Speaker also presides over the chamber, making sure that the rules are followed in the House, that the rules of debate and, and right. process are fair and upheld. But the third role is he is the defender of the institution, that uh, the the rights and privileges that members of parliament have. And when we say this, that term rights and privileges, we're not talking about uh, perks for MPs. We're talking about the ability for members of parliament to do their job, uh, to question the government, to get access to documents, uh, to um, hold public servants to account. That's what I'm talking about. The Speaker defends those privileges because when members of Parliament do that part of their job, they are acting on your behalf. They get that information so that Canadians can see it. That's the that's the way that these details come to light. It's through the House of Commons, through its work at committees and question period and ordering the production of these documents. And whenever those rights are, are, are infringed upon or challenged, that's when the speaker steps in and says, no, it's my job to defend this on behalf of the institutions so that democracy can continue to function in Canada. Okay. You sound like Professor Shear this morning. It's very, <laughs> no, it's very good. I, I need you to explain because uh, um, I think this is where it get, may, may get confusing for a lot of people. The difference, say, between the party that governs uh, and parliament. What's the difference there, Mr. Scheer? Well, we don't directly elect uh, our head of government like they do in other countries. We elect members of parliament to uh, the House of Commons and the leader of the group of MPs that has the most amount of support gets to form, uh, the government gets to become the prime minister. And uh, so that's the, that, that is the biggest difference, that the government is taken out of that body of members of parliament. And that is why parliament has always been supreme. That is why parliament is, is, is above the government in, in, in that respect. Right, right, right. I want people to understand this. This is yeah. very important right now, especially with this, what the liberals are trying to do here. It's very important, I think, for the average Canadian to understand how their parliament works. It, it, parliament exactly. is supreme over the governing party. It's the parliament that trumps, so to speak, the government. Right, Mr. Shear? Exactly. The, yeah. the, the House of Commons can express non-confidence. It can uh, force an election. It can overturn things uh, because it is supreme. It is uh, the, the government answers to the House of Commons. It answers to Parliament. And this is even more important in a minority situation. Canadians elected 
a minority parliament. They did not give Justin Trudeau a mandate to govern with a majority. And he must respect that decision because parliament is above government, because government has to answer to parliament. And by flouting the, the law here, flouting 150, if not 1,000 years of parliamentary tradition, once again, we, we've seen this before with Justin Trudeau. You know, we've seen it with his ethics violations. Uh, we've seen it with his corruption scandals where he says, well, there's one set of rules for everybody else, but there's a different set of rules for me. And keep in mind here, you know, we're talking about a lab in Winnipeg that is, has now been revealed has, has links to the Chinese military through these, uh, these two scientists had links to the Chinese military. We're transferring some sort of virus or, 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 or materials to China. Uh, in your intro, you said this is like a Tom Clancy novel. When I first read this report, I thought, is this, is this a plot line for an episode of 24? Uh, or, or, right. or, yeah. or, you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, this is, this is, this is a big deal. We're just, starting to come out of a pandemic that has seized the world, that has shut down uh, our economy, that has cost the lives of thousands of Canadians. And the government has been caught being less than truthful before. They, right. they, you know, but, uh, but, all kinds of things have come yeah. out and, and Parliament has a right to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, and I want to circle back so we don't get too off track here mm-hmm. to the role of our MPs, all of them in the House. And um, there's been a vote by our parliament and the majority in the house has said we want to see the documents okay which should be enough but the liberals have said no so the speaker has found them to be in contempt and has said you must produce the documents so so now the liberals are taking the speaker to court what resources does the speaker have to fight in court against the government of the day? Well, uh, you know, that, that, that is a great question, and, and it does frame it very well. Here we have uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons, who, who, who normally, you know, looks at internal procedural matters, now being asked to go and defend our institution uh, on behalf of Canadians, on behalf of members of Parliament. It, it, it really is kind of a David and Goliath story when you consider the the legion of lawyers that the government has at its disposal. And, you know, we haven't seen this kind of clash between Parliament and the government in, in, in generations. It's never reached this point. Uh, this, fortunately, the Speaker does have uh, a law clerk and, and a team of lawyers uh, for, uh, for Parliament that will no doubt be uh, be springing into action. And uh, if the Speaker decides he needs outside help as well, that, that's an option too. Uh, uh, when I was Speaker, we had a couple of court uh, cases that we had to uh, get some expert uh, help from outside our own internal teams. So that is available to the Speaker should he decide uh, to use it. But, you know, this is going to cost Canadians hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal bills. It's going to, uh, it's threatening to undermine the pillar of our democracy that is the, 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 the principle that nobody is above scrutiny, that, that oversight and transparency that Canadians exercise through their elected members of parliament is a sacred principle of our Canadian democracy. We, we cannot allow this to be eroded. There are constant pressures that government tries to get more power for itself or uh, try to keep more and more things secret. And Parliament fights against that. And that's why this court case should matter to every single Canadian. I would like to know what your reaction was upon learning that uh, or even seeing that Ian Stewart uh, of the Public Health Agency of Canada was called to the bar, admonished by the Speaker of the House. That hasn't happened in more than 100 years in Canada. I mean, this everything that's going on that's surrounding this story is... Um, it, it, it's the, the kind of thing... We have not seen this sort of stuff ever in our lifetimes, Mr. Shear. It's so... No, it's it, that it, extraordinary, so... It is, it is. And, and, and the fact that it hasn't happened... Uh, it, in, in over a hundred years should tell Canadians that this is a, a big deal. Um, the government should never put Mr. Stewart in that situation. Uh, the government should have just said to him, look, uh, Parliament is supreme. We recognize the tradition and, and, and the law and the constitution here in Canada. So go ahead and, and give the documents to the House of Commons. And just so your listeners know, 
the opposition parties were very reasonable on the request. We did not. We we understand that sometimes if you get a big document dump, there can be national security uh, issues at stake or sensitive personal information for staff that otherwise you know should not expect their personal details to be divulged. And so we established a framework whereby the law clerk would go through the documents before they were made public and redact anything that could jeopardize public safety. And this is precisely the model that former Speaker Milliken used with the Afghan detainee documents from a few years ago, where obviously when Canada was at, uh, you know, involved in a military operation, there were major concerns about national security. And what we were saying is, look, let's have the independent law clerk who serves all parliamentarians, nonpartisan position. Let's let him make those decisions as to what should be redacted and kept uh, secret and what could be uh, presented to the committee. And that wasn't that was the model that the, the opposition parties used under the former conservative government to find that balance between public disclosure and oversight and protecting national security. And the, this government this time said no. Hey, we're watching it with great interest. I hope you're well these days. Yeah, do, doing well. You know, uh, we're, we're looking forward to restrictions lifting here in Saskatchewan in a couple of uh, a couple of weeks. I know it's been a long haul for the people of Ontario, and uh, we're all hoping that we can put all this behind us as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you for your time this morning, sir. Thank Bye. you very much. All the best. Bye. Yeah. Um, Andrew Shear, former leader of the Conservative Party, former Speaker of the House. Steve Warren on the big Habs win last night. That's up next on City News. It's such a beautiful feel because it's all natural. Um, I'm able to talk to a lot of people who are going through different uh, journeys of health where they really don't know where to start, where to begin. And I'm happy and grateful to have all this knowledge where I can actually help them and guide them. So, um, of course, you know, medications have a great place in our system, but even so do natural therapies, which have been around for centuries and centuries. Like, you know, uh, old time, ancient times, everything herbs grew, everything was done with nature, all healing was done with nature, so I'm totally in love with all the elements with nature. In our beautiful village of Manatic, the Manatic Natural Market, you can find tremendous different things. So we have herbs, we have vitamins, uh, we have natural uh, body care, uh, we do infrared sauna therapy, uh, nutrition counseling, acupuncture, bone therapy, energy healing. So we're like a wellness hub uh, along with being a full health food store. We are one year into pandemic since it started last year in March. Um, it was a shock, usually I see things coming and I definitely did not see that coming. Golden Root is a product that I created uh, four years ago, actually for my kids, uh, just for immune system, overall health, and it just took off with certain friends of mine who had cancer or some severe issues and they started finding that it was really helping them uh, from um, different um, tests they had done with their doctor and I knew I had something really special so then I went through the proper uh, procedure of being able to sell it so it's actually I'm not allowed to make it anymore in my house four years ago and it is made in a Health uh, Canada approved lab and then it comes to me and what Golden Root is is a formulation of turmeric, ginger, lavender, oregano and black pepper all food grade which is the most bioavailable turmeric in the market right now for pain, inflammation, digestion, immune system, concussion, liver health and brain health so uh, and it tastes like salad dressing. We do a lot of in-house, so we make our in-house uh, concoctions of teas. Uh, you can come here, tell us what your health issues are, and we can blend it right there. And there's some that are already prepared beforehand for sleeping, for anxiety, for different things. And in that bar, we basically make cold brew teas and cold brew nitrogen coffee. And again, it's uh, all local. Everything we do is local, and as many herbs we can find uh, locally as well. If a car client can come out, We'll go out our way to deliver it. Uh, and you're getting that personal touch when you come in. If you have an issue, we will listen and help you. We're very, very active in the community, so we would like the same thing back for the community to come to.
Show Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. So here, 90 seconds in, Petrangelo's had a chance. That hot shot. Looks like it caught right to the mask. A chance for Pacioretty, and now back the other way. It's to no win. Last night for Montreal, Fête Nationale, fireworks and tear gas off to their first Stanley Cup final since 1993. Steve Warren is back from the Sens Nation podcast and the Steve Warren Project. Steve, good morning. Good morning, Rob. Do you believe in miracles, Steve? Well, I do in this case. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the most surprising run to a cup final that I, I mean, I've never been more surprised about a round of the cup final that I am with this year's Habs. That's just been nuts. And last night was nuts as well. What do you think has been the key to victory for the Habs? What's, what's gotten them here, Steve? Well, Carey Price, Exhibit A, yeah. playing out of his mind. Yeah. And he's not doing it in a Dominic Hasek type of way. He's doing it in standard Carey Price style. Not, uh, not that flopper. Just so calm and square to the puck and anticipating everything. Uh, it just, you know, like old, like Jack Armstrong and TSN, anytime somebody stuffs somebody, he says, get that garbage out of here. That's kind of Carey Price right now. Um, and then you throw in Cole Caulfield. Uh, I think about what Montreal is doing in this, in this playoff run. Maybe he's a catalyst here as well. Maybe kind of the, the Habs version of the Hamburglar in this story. Uh, he's been really good in, in particular in this series. He's so small. He's, so inexperienced, but man, is it fun to watch him fly around out here. It just seems like he's a step faster yep. than everyone else. And, 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 and the way people talk about him, his have teammates watching him with Phil Deneau during the post game. Deneau just seems like he already reveres the kid. He's just a, a real yeah. breath of fresh air in that dressing room. So, you know, those might be my two guys that yeah. I point to right away for the big turnaround. Like that, that goal by Caulfield last night. I mean... You, you don't coach that. You're born with that. That was just a thing of beauty last night, what he scored. You know? Yeah. Can you imagine that the Habs didn't have him in the lineup no. for the first yeah. two games of these playoffs? Yeah. He's been uh, just yeah. lethal. And how they do in those games, Steve, uh, right? Yeah. Well, they got off to a sluggish start, as we all yeah. know, against the Toronto Maple Leafs. So um, lots of comparisons to 1993. What were you doing in 19... I was 22, Steve. Uh, I don't know how old you were, but uh, I think you're a few years older than me. If <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> were, you in the, were you in the news media at the time, or by that time, or 93? Yeah, that's a lot. That, that was my first job in Ottawa because oh, okay. Uh, okay. there was a lot of shuffling around of bodies when the Ottawa Senators arrived on the scene. And, uh, yeah, I moved in to become... Uh, well, the sports director of this radio station. This radio station here, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I was 22. I was actually, uh, I wasn't even in Ottawa. I was spending the summer with my dad in Cape Breton, uh, and I was working the graveyard shift at a Tim Hortons. Wow. Yeah, but it was perfect because they were playing Los Angeles. So, and it, the games in Los Angeles didn't start till like 10 o'clock Eastern, which is 11 o'clock Atlantic time, which was when my shift started. So, <laughs> I, so I, would, I would bring the little black and white TV to work. And, I, and all, you remember so many games went to overtime, Steve? All those games went to overtime, right? So, well, you're right, to, you're right to make the comparison to 93 yeah. because this has that uncanny feel to it. What Montreal is doing here is just so unexpected. And you think about 93, and you're right, 10 overtime games. The Montreal Canadiens went to overtime 10 times. So... This thing has that standard Montreal Canadiens mystique to it, ghosts of the past. Um, I'm, I'm definitely on the Montreal bandwagon now as far as uh, who I think has a shot to win this whole And thing. isn't that hard to do? Isn't that hard to do? Um, because <laughs> you and I, I mean, we, we like bleed for the Ottawa Senators. I f typically find the Montreal fans just slightly less insufferable than the Leaf fans. And... When it comes to the Leafs, I'd cheer for the Russians before I would cheer for the Leafs. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, um, but it, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch the Habs. But 1993, totally unrelated to hockey. I was looking up, I Googled 
top songs of 1993. Because, nice. Yeah. This was not the top song. It was number two. This classic called Wump. There it is. These three words, but you're getting busy. Wump. There it is. Hit me. There it is. <laughs> Doesn't it take you back? Yes. Um, well, num- lyrically, I, lyrically, I'd ask the question, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Number one, according to Billboard, year-end Hot 100, 1993, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston, followed by Wump. Wump, there it is. <laughs> by a group called Tag Team. Tag Team. And uh, number three, I can't help falling in love by UB40, just in case everyone wants to relive 1993 all over again. Okay, tonight, uh, there's a game seven. And uh, your team that you picked to go all the way here, New York Islanders. My gosh, what a gutsy team, Steve. Think about this. They've managed to force a game seven against Tampa, heavily favored Tampa Lightning, and... they gave up 10 goals in a row, Steve. Um, they lost 8 nothing, and then they gave up the first two goals, and yet they still managed to force the seventh game. I mean, after the 10th goal, I mean, if you're playing for the Islanders, you got to think, it's over for us. It's over. But they dug deep, and they, they, they got it to a game seven. Who do you like tonight? Well, certainly, you got to like the momentum that the Islanders have. You're right, the mental strength that it requires to rally from an 8 nothing loss in Game 5 to win Game 6. And, uh, you know, then you factor in Nikita Kucherov. If he plays, I think there's no doubt that's a significant injury that, that he absorbed in that last Game 6. It happened in the first shift in Game 6, and he missed the rest of the game. So you know it's significant. He wouldn't have stayed out the whole game if it was something that you could easily play through. So they might, hey, they might throw him full of painkillers and he's out there, but there's no way he's the standard Nikita Kucherov. So ask me who I like for tonight. I might as well go with the Islanders who I picked before the playoffs to win the Stanley Cup. But again, nothing but admiration for being able to rally back the way the Sens did actually in 2017. If you think back to the Eastern Final, Pittsburgh beat them 7-0 in Game 5 and somehow the Sens clamped down and won the next game to force a game number 7 that we will not discuss, Rob. No, we won't. No, we won't. We will end our discussion there for this week. Uh, Enjoy that Game 7 tonight. And we'll talk to you you next week. Thank you so much, Steve. Steve Warren of the Sens Nation podcast and the Steve Warren Project on all your podcasting platforms. Queens Park Week in Review is after the news right here on City News. It doesn't.
in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, the 25th of June. Good morning. I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa, mostly cloudy skies, 21 degrees, cloudy and 19 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. Ottawa Public Health confirms 18 new cases of COVID-19 in the capital out of 256 new cases across Ontario. Health officials report two new deaths province-wide due to the virus. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Granville Lanark Health Unit has one new case. The region actually has two active cases in total. And Public Health Ontario is reporting one new case each in the Eastern Ontario and Renfrew County Health Unit regions. The local health units will update their numbers in the afternoon. Starting tomorrow, children and youth aged 12 to 17 who live in Delta variant hotspots in this province will be able to book a quicker appointment for a COVID-19 vaccine. And as of Monday... All adults in Ontario who have had a first dose of an mRNA vaccine, that's Pfizer or Moderna, can book accelerated second dose vaccine appointments. The province says it's expanding eligibility as 76% of Ontarians have had at least one vaccine dose and more than 30% are fully vaccinated. The Trudeau government is adding two more extreme right-wing groups and an American neo-Nazi to its list of terrorist entities as it tries to counter the rise of white nationalist violence. Public Safety Minister Bill Blair announced today... The Three Percenters and Aryan Strike Force will join the list alongside the Proud Boys who were added in February after the storming of Capitol Hill in Washington January 6th. Members of the Three Percenters have been linked to a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan and senior intelligence officials say Canadian chapters have carried out training activities in Alberta and British Columbia. And the 69-year-old white supremacist named James Mason, who officials describe as a lifelong neo-Nazi who has provided ideological and tactical instruction on terrorist group organizations in the U.S. has also been placed on the list of 77 entities. I'm Sarah Buckin for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. The MPPs are all with us. They include today Fran Shellina back with us on the Rob Snow Show for Queen's Park Week in Review. She is the New Democrat MPP. The riding is Nickel Belt, and she's on the line from Sudbury. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, it's great to hear from you. Stephen Blay is the Liberal MPP. His riding is Ottawa Orleans. Good hey, morning. Welcome back. Welcome back, Stephen. Nice to hear from you. And David Piccini is the Progressive Conservative MPP for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Good morning, David. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for and, having me on. Uh, congratulations are in order for you, David Piccini, as I understand it, elevated to the cabinet in the cabinet shuffle. Congratulations, yeah, David. Much. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Really looking forward to it. Uh, proof positive once again, uh, the Rob Snow Show is the path to cabinet. Uh, I would point out that... Uh, <laughs> I'm All just, started, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, no, but John Yakubuski, for the longest time, when the progressive conservatives were in opposition, John Yakubuski was a member of this panel. I've been doing this panel for like 10, 12 years. And um, John was, was with us every Friday, and uh, then the election came, and um, Doug Ford put him in the cabinet right away. So David's probably uh, going to be busy brushing up on his new... It's in, you're the Minister of the Environment, David, right? Yes, really yeah, excited. Yeah, so a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to do there. So Ontario's history in the environment, and looking forward to tackling okay. it. Good, good, good. Well, we'll important. talk about it. We'll yeah. talk about it. I'm sure your colleagues probably have a few things to say about the environment file and what you should do. But we'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> people want to talk. Uh, you know, a top of mind, I think, for a lot of people, vaccination program and the reopening. The latest numbers, according to my uh, producer, are this. 76.9% of adults in Ontario have received one dose, and 30.9% are now fully vaccinated. As for the case numbers, here they are for eastern Ontario today. Seven in Ottawa, one in Renfrew, one in the eastern Ontario health unit, which would be the Cornwall-Hawkesbury area. Uh, The Leeds uh, Grenville health unit, no cases. In Ottawa, seven people are in hospital, three are in ICU. We have 150 active cases. So the situation considerably improved 
And as for the vaccination numbers, more than 200,000 vaccinations being done every day. Under the reopening roadmap, which is what the government called it many weeks ago, those numbers, the vaccine numbers, should qualify the province to be in step three. Yet, the province remains in step one. It will move to step two next week, a few days ahead of schedule. But David, why are Ontarians still stuck in step one? Well, we're moving to step two, which I think is a is a big step forward. And I know getting our lives back. I mean, I've, as I walk through my community, people are, are out in the community. Businesses are, are open and uh, people are excited to get their lives back. It's important to note, though, that when getting a double vaccine, uh, it still takes well, well over uh, 14 to 21 days for, for full efficacy to set in, full protection. We know that, um, you know, that we've seen in other jurisdictions uh, putting a pause on reopening in the UK, scaling things back, we saw in Manitoba. Um, and I just think we want to take a cautious, a prudent approach going forward to not look back. Um, we know that one in four Ontarians still don't have a vaccine, so we're doing unique things like, for example, in my community, mobile vaccine clinic to target vaccine hesitancy, going into manufacturers um, and, and getting aggressively out in the community. So, we, you know, we, as we, we're hopeful, as we've been from step one and two, that if we keep vaccinating Ontarians, we have no issue entering uh, step three as soon as we can. Okay. Fran Shellina, what do you think of the pace of the reopening right now? Well, I mean, Ontario had the longest lockdown for the third wave. The government did not want to spend the money that would allow us to get out of there quicker. Uh, they are now very worried that if they move, they could have to spend a few dollars, and God forbid they have to do this. So they're dragging this out. Meanwhile, in my writing, I mean, I have entire strip malls that every single business is closed, will never reopen. Their uh, owners did not ask for the uh, federal uh, rent subsidy program, and uh, they, c they couldn't make it. So a uh, hairdresser, a restaurant, a uh, chiropractor, a, uh, a um, mining-related business, they're all gone, and it's the same thing throughout my writing. This is really tough. Am I happy we're going to be in step two next week? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But should we, we be in step three? Should we better. be in step three? Should we be in step three? Some people yeah. say, let's skip this step two business. Let's go to step three. What, what do you think about that, France? Uh, <laughs> let's go to step three. Yeah. The, I, I would say we have a, um, we have a table, yeah. an advisory table that gives us advice. But the last advice we got, I mean, they have a website, is from way, way back. We don't, the government doesn't share with us what is it that the medical advisor are saying? What is it that um, they base their decisions on? Uh, so I, I'm guessing that they base their decision on anything but science and what, and what the table is, uh, are telling them. And uh, maybe we could uh, do way better we just won't know because they won't share with us um, the advice that they have been getting. Uh, so here we are with more and more businesses that are not going to make it. Our business needs a business that are forced closed, uh, need some support. Those businesses did nothing wrong. The government forced them shut. Their okay, dream okay. of, of livelihood is gone and the government doesn't want to help dragged them. it out she uh, okay so france is saying Stephen, that uh the government is dragging it out because they don't want to spend any money what do you think about that uh analysis well certainly the third wave ha has been prolonged in ontario and largely because uh the government ignored the advice in february from the medical experts not to open uh at, at, at that point uh the, the third wave was predicted you the news conference is is, is well documented i'm sure everyone remembers uh, the medical experts uh, predicted that a third wave would would be disastrous i think is the quote and that's exactly as it as it's turned out to be to france's point uh, the government has been slow um to provide supports to small business owners uh, they they haven't provided a third round of, of small business supports many businesses still haven't received the the, the original supports that they've uh, tried to to apply for and, and uh, just as happened last summer 
uh, when you know people uh, started to get outside, transmission went down. Uh, instead of focusing on uh, keeping things that way, instead of focusing on uh, a reopening plan that's safe uh, for kids in the fall, uh, the Premier and his cabinet are on a, a victory lap of Ontario uh, making announcements. And as Randall Denley quite rightly pointed out in the Ottawa Citizen uh, this morning, uh, the Premier and his government should be uh, with their uh, with the ministry uh, working out how we're going to uh, put uh, COVID to bed uh, through the vaccination program and have a safe reopening for school uh, in the fall. And, and right now, that's not what they're doing. Okay. You dragged it out, David. That's the accusation from your colleagues here on the panel. It didn't have to be this bad or last this long. How do you react to that, David? Well, I mean, I think globally everybody's been uh, grappling with this pandemic. I find it quite rich uh, coming from um, MPP play about dragging anything out. I mean, they had 15 years in which they could have expanded nursing seats to address health care shortages. They didn't. They could have funded hospitals properly and addressed the medium and small size funding hospital formula. They didn't. They could have built capacity and long-term care uh, to address some of the systemic challenges we know, overcrowding. They didn't. Um, so we're doing all of those things. You know, first nursing expansion and as I said, over 20 years, 2,000 uh, more nurses, free PSW training, um, without question, are there lessons learned? And, uh, you know, can we always reflect and look back on things we could have done better as a government? Absolutely. We're always willing uh, to listen. But I've heard no suggestions tangibly on, you know, do, did you support the expansion of the nursing seat? Yes or no. Would you have done it? Should the Liberal government have done it in the last 15 years? Probably. Should they have built more LTC spaces? Yeah, probably. Long-term care. Um, and, and with respect to uh, France, she just didn't answer your question. If we should move to step three earlier, she knows that the, that the science table, um, that that science table publishes on their website independent of any government direction. And, uh, and, and most of those epidemiologists and doctors are on CP24, uh, radio news, CTV, regular, on a regular basis, and sure. they support the three-step plan to reopening. They support okay. what the government's doing. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to, want to respond, or can we move on to another topic? I'll leave it up to you. Um, anybody want to respond? I say I'm tired of talking about pandemic. Let's all right, talk okay. About I'll, but the pandemic. All right, okay. I agree with. Well, that. I mean, the next the next topic is 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 not a, a happy topic, but it must be it must be discussed nevertheless. Many people are shocked and horrified by the recent news about residential schools. The Ontario government recently announced $10 million in funding to survey the grounds of 18 residential schools that were active in Ontario. What else, I'll, I'll start with you, Franz, what else do you think the Ontario government could do to help advance reconciliation with the Indigenous? There are many of the 94 recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation that fall squarely within the responsibility of the provincial government. Build schools on reserve why is it that uh, we take the kids you know like there's a 3,000 4,000 5,000 community and yet we send the kids out of their community to go to school why is it that they don't have access to health care a woman who's seven months pregnant has to leave her community for two months to be able to deliver her baby uh, health care uh, education clean water all of this the provincial government must do to um, to respect reconciliation. It is fine uh, to to say nice words, and we are all horrified by those lives lost. Those children should be adults and grandparents right now, and should be there among us. And they are not. Uh, but the government has to do more than than say we'll give you a bit of money to see how many more uh, bodies of dead First Nations children lay beside residential school. There are actions that can be taken right now. Okay. 34 First Nations don't have drinking water. We know how to bring drinking water to every community, but we're not doing it because they're First Nations. Okay. Stephen Blay. Yeah, no, I think I think France is right in terms. Of there are there are real things today to help improve the quality of life uh, of, of indigenous peaceful people, both on reserve and off reserve, that the government needs to focus on. But we also have to address uh, the the fact that too many Canadians, I would argue, probably most non-indigenous Canadians didn't truly appreciate and understand what happened in residential schools, didn't understand this, the scope of the, the violence 
um, and, and the maltreatment. And this goes back to teaching our kids about it in school. Uh, under the last government, there was a plan to bring this type of education into the classroom at an age-appropriate level uh, across all public, uh, uh, publicly funded uh, grades in, in education. And almost immediately upon taking office in 2018, the Ford government canceled that curriculum change. Uh, we need to teach right. our kids. But hasn't uh, that been been indigenous relations? Uh, I I was well. under the impression, Steve, that it, it, yes, it had been pulled, but now that it it was revised and replaced and that there is um, a curriculum now on residential schools. Sorry? You know, in, in fairness, uh, I have a son who just uh, finished grade six. Yeah. Uh, I would argue, I would argue that he is learning more about indigenous peoples than I did uh, when I was in school, but he has not learned about residential schools. He has okay. not learned okay. about the I agree. I agree that it, absolutely. I agree as someone who went to public school, not in Ontario, but I didn't learn anything about residential schools when I was in school. Um, but but I, I, you know, I, I, I would like some clarity on, I understand that the curriculum was pulled, but, but I believe it was revised and then replaced and that it, that it is active now. But David, what do you think, David? Well, you're correct. It has been a revised, replaced. There is far more uh, Indigenous curriculum today. And do we have more to do? Yes. Um, there's there's always more, and I think the very recent and real uh, discovery of of the remains of you know the, this is a, this is a pure, this is an absolute tragedy, and it's a scar on our nation's history. So we're it's about constantly listening, it's about constantly learning. I know in my community, I work in partnership with Hiawatha and Alderville First Nation and in Northumberland Peterborough South. And it's it's listening. I spent a, a day yesterday doing a pop up office with Chief Carr, and, and listening and constantly learning, and then taking those those teachings, and and seeing that reflected in what we do at Queens Park. So you know, I, I really think this is a nonpartisan issue. I take MPP Blaze's point that education is critical. He's right. Um, France is right that there's a lot to do now in the Ministry of Environment portfolio. I immediately sort of sucked my teeth into uh, working closely with the federal government on a number of of key initiatives. I think, um, you know, there was a promise made to bring clean drinking water into these communities. Um, the federal government has not stayed true to that. Uh, we're, we're working and, and leveraging, you know, every resource within the ministry that I'm in right now to address that. I think there's some important projects like uh, under the Investing in Canada infrastructure stream, we have brought a number of important water and wastewater projects uh, in, in a number of Indigenous communities, there's absolutely, without question, more to be done. Um, you know, on, on, on important, the teaching element, oh, you know, this, this government expanded OSAP eligibility for Indigenous institutes, which is, which is culturally sensitive learning, um, you know, led by elders and others at, at a number of Indigenous institutes in this province. So, you know, I think there, there, are, there are important steps being made. Without question, there's more to do. Okay, we'll be right back. Part two. I want to talk about the cabinet shuffle that that happened. When we come back with Queen's Park Week in Review on City News. An old fashioned traditional grocery store. You're going to find a butcher. Okay. You want a steak cut a certain way, you're going to get it. You know, there's flour piled in the warehouse. There's mixers on the floor. There's flour on the floor. Uh, the bakery is rented out to Frank Niccolo, it's him and his son come in at night, they mix the dough, they roll the dough, and they bake the dough. It's not the traditional uh, frozen and thaw and put it in the, in the bin, okay? It's made from scratch seven days a week. It's probably the only bakery left in Ottawa that does that. You know, then customer service, you know, we're, we're, we're big on that. The, uh, the cashiers, the, the deli, you're, you're not, if so, you ask for something, they're not going to point, it's an aisle number seven, they're going to bring you there, okay? If you have too much groceries out, we'll take it out to your car, you know what I mean? There's nothing we don't do for our customers. And we evolved around our customers. They would come in and say, you know, can you try getting me this? You know, can you get me this? So that's how we built the lineup we have now, okay? So we have a lot of unique items that someone that uh, came over to, you know, live in Canada, hasn't seen this particular product, but we sourced it and we have it for them that, you know, like something they used to have as a kid. We have a lot of those unique items, a lot. You know, uh, from Germ like all over the world. And we source it through, you know, uh, distributors in Montreal and Toronto that bring in the product in bulk 
and we piggyback off of them. Probably the, uh, the largest European deli in Ottawa. We, we're, we, we sell lots because people buy lots. Nothing really complicated about that. You know, we turn over a lot of product. You know, we package it properly. We buy, and we're always uh, consistent. You know, you're always going to buy, you know, cutty turkey breast. You know, San Daniel Mortadella. You're always going to get the same brands. We don't flip back and forth to save 20 cents. It's always the same brands the last 29 years. Best sandwiches in town. It's simple. It starts off with fresh bread every day baked in the store. Anything that's left over goes to breadcrumbs. So you're getting a fresh bun every day that was baked probably four hours before you get here. Okay. Not only baked, made, like, you know, mix the flour, roll the dough, proof the bread and bake the bread. Okay. Then all the ingredients come right off the shelves. You know, your lettuce, your tomatoes, all your condiments, and they're cut up fresh in the deli. Not like the big, you know, ch corporate restaurant chains that your lettuce comes in shredded in the bag, you open it up and you throw it in the bin. You know, takes, you know, two or three days to get here from California. How long is it in the bag? The big difference is like making a sandwich at home and you don't have to do the work. It's really what the trick is and using the freshest ingredients possible. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, uh, we're back. It's Queen's Park Week in Review, part two. We're here with David Piccini, progressive conservative MPP, Northumberland, Peterborough South. And in the most recent cabinet shuffle, he was named Ontario's new Minister of the Environment. Uh, Stephen Blay is the Liberal MPP for Ottawa Orleans. And Franciella is the NDP MPP for Nickel Belt, and she's in Sudbury this morning. I want to start with you, uh, Steve, because um, you're familiar with the Eastern Ontario MPPs here. Um, John Yakabuski's out. Um, I don't really want to focus on that, but Dr. Fullerton has also been shuffled out of her portfolio at the minister as the Minister of Long-Term Care, and I'd like your reaction to that, please, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Rob. You know, in, in fairness, uh, you know, Dr. Fullerton, as Minister of Long-Term Care, kind of oversaw uh, one of the worst COVID responses um, uh, in North America. You know, thousands of people uh, died in long-term care here in Ontario. Uh, we were promised or told there would be an iron ring to protect them and, and the employees who worked there. That just didn't materialize. One of the worst hit long-term care facilities it was in Orleans, uh, Madonna uh, care, care community. And uh, for that effort, uh, Mary Lee Fullerton has arguably been promoted to Minister of, uh, of Children's Services. You know, I think it, I believe it's the third or fourth largest ministry by budget. Uh, and when we broadly look at the uh, the cabinet change, the Minister of Education has remained the same. The Minister of Health remained the same. Uh, the, the finance ministers remain the same. The solicitor generals remain the same. The attorney generals remain the same. Uh, the top tier of the cabinet has remained the same. And so after going through tumultuous uh, first two years of, of the Ford regime, um, an even worse uh, response uh, to the pandemic, really the premier has just uh, just shuffled the, the, the deck chairs a little bit um, uh, to as a PR as a PR exercise as an electoral exercise not really with the with the view of, of improving the cabinet from a from an operational or functional level okay is that your view French Elena uh, window dressing similar. it's window dressing <laughs> uh, very very I, I agree I mean we are not through this pandemic, although I don't want to talk about it anymore, it is still there. It is pretty odd that you would need to change uh, the cabinet shuffle when the pandemic is not over. And one that continues to hurt me is uh, Rob Phillips back into cabinet. Mm. This is a minister who disregarded the a directive from public health tried to cover it up with a whole bunch of videos pretending that he was in Ontario when he was in St. Bart. And here he is back in cabinet as minister of long-term care. Um, <laughs> this is really hard to swallow. And, uh, and for the rest of them, I, I still thought that Minister Yakubuski was doing a very good job at, as a minister of uh, 
um, okay. MNRF, uh, Northern um, Natural Resources and Forest. And now all of this is under one ministry. It 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 doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it a lot. All of right, all right, needed, okay. And I, it looks at desperation. Thank you, friends. David, what happened? No, uh, you know, <laughs> John Yagabuski, man, oh man. Okay, um, look, uh, Marilee Fullerton, was she promoted? Uh, how, well, how, how do you explain it, David? What, what? Yeah, I'll, I'll try not to take this personally, given that I was one of the people put in there, but yeah. I, I'm excited. I mean, I, this is about putting in place a new generation of ministers that better reflect the makeup of this province. We've got a younger, more diverse cabinet with more women and, and we don't you know um, I, I acknowledge and I'm, I'm saying this now but this wasn't come out with uh, platitudes from the premier he just did it um, you know it's a story of third generation uh, you know myself I think to my grandfather who came over from Italy worked at Stelco two generations later youngest environment minister in the province of Ontario I see colleagues like my my colleague Prabhmeet Sarkaria um, and Parm Gill Again, uh, you know, th this is a story of immigrants coming, the, the opportunity that Ontario provides, and now they're in, in Canada making these decisions. We're putting a team in place that is more geographically a representative of the province as well. Younger caucus members have had time to get on their feet and really step up to the plate. And so I think this is exciting uh, for many. It's, uh, you know, I understand it's not easy for those that that aren't uh, continuing on, but I, I think, okay. you know, like in any company, you, you know, you, you, have, you have growth. Uh, new people take on new roles, and I'm I'm very much excited uh, for the opportunity, as are many, uh, to to continue growing this province, growing our economy, getting on be beyond COVID, and and supporting Ontarians. Thank you, everybody. We're right out of time. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, bye bye. That's that's Queens Park Weekend Review. Francesca and Stephen Blay and David Piccini, our MPPs this week. Back on Monday after the nine o'clock news. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. The Rob Snow Show. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV.